Morning, everybody. Is it on? There we go. There we go. All right. All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Jane, would you call the roll? Regent Drew? Here. Regent Evers? Here. Regent Falbo? Here. Regent Higgins? Here. Regent Rybar? Here. Regent Menedith? Here. Regent Milner? Here. Regent Pointer? Here. Regent Pruitt? Here. Regent Roberts? Here. Regent Smith? Here. Regent Tyler? Regent Vasquez? Here. Regent Walsh? Regent Whitburn? Here. The quorum is present. Thank you, Jane. Good morning again. As we make our uh, annual trip to UW-Milwaukee, I'd like to say thanks once again to Chancellor Lovell and their team for their hospitality. We've seen a lot of uh, exciting ideas and activities here in the next couple of days and uh, look forward to hearing about those from uh, representatives of UW-Milwaukee. And before, we've got a really full agenda this morning. Um, we're hoping to get done by noon, but we'll see. Uh, before we get started, I think President Riley has an introduction or two. Thank you, President Smith, and good morning all. Good to, good to see you all. Uh, I wanted to take a second to uh, introduce the new provost at uh, Stout, Joseph Bessie. Is, is Joseph with us? He is. There. Joseph, welcome. He's uh, Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs at Stout. Uh, he comes to us from St. Martin's University in Lacey, Washington, where he was Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. He may have spent a number of years near the West Coast, at least, but he's no stranger to the upper Midwest. He earned his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Minnesota and a Master's of Business Administration from Southwest Minnesota State. He also previously held administrative positions at Valley City State University in North Dakota. His areas of academic specialization include the philosophy of science, mathematical logic, and management ethics. So we uh, welcome you, Provost Bessie, and wish you all success in your new job. Welcome. Back to you, Brent. Well, as I mentioned, UW-Milwaukee uh, is a very busy place these days, and to tell us more about it and get us going on our meeting, I'm going to turn it over to Chancellor Mike Lovell. Well, thank you, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. <clears throat> I think we all know that we always haven't been shed uh, too well in the light in the press recently, and uh, I think if I look at my Chancellor colleagues, we all know there's great things going on on our campuses, and I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about some of the things that we're doing here at UWM. And just to <clears throat> put things into context, we talk about the transformation, what's happening on our campus, and I always say that we're, that we're changing faster than any time in our history. Uh, we've had unprecedented growth over the last decade. Uh, uh, this past year, we graduated almost 5,500 uh, students. That represents a 38% increase over the last decade. So clearly, uh, we have a larger student population. That, that when they graduate, 90% of them are staying within the states, and so they're making the impact you know, upon the state once they, once they leave here. Uh, but what also is happening is we're seeing a transformation of that population that are coming to UWM. As many of you know, we recently brought two new dorms online, and now we require all of our freshmen to live on campus. So we're becoming more of a traditional campus. In fact, we have uh, 15,000 uh, of our students live within four blocks of our campus. And so that obviously uh, creates a much different dynamic than in the past, where 30 or 40 years ago we were primarily a commuter campus, and we only had students living um, within, usually within the seven counties around Milwaukee. Uh, the transformation is also happening in, in other different ways at UWM. Uh, today, we have 1,250 international students uh, on our campus. Uh, we have a goal to get to 3,000 uh, students. We are recruiting heavily right now in China, Taiwan, India, Brazil, and Korea. Uh, we also are trying to recruit more out-of-state students. Uh, we currently have 8% of our students from, Wisconsin, uh, from out, outside of Wisconsin. We have a goal to get to 15%. 
Uh, and today, I talk about the transformation of our student population. Uh, we have students from every county in Wisconsin, every state in the U.S., and from 84 countries uh, from around the world. And in spite of the fact that we have more traditional students on our campus and the fact that we have more students from outside of our states, uh, we are still true to our serving our access mission. Uh, <clears throat> our most recent uh, set of students showed that we had almost 50 percent, 48 Eight percent of our students were first-generation students, and uh, with the national average about 21 percent. So we are significantly over uh, that average. And we talk about the median income of our students. Uh, the families uh, have about 60,000 uh, median income, whereas Madison is 99, almost 100,000 for the median income. So we have a different dynamic uh, in our student popu body population, where almost all of our students work. Uh, many of them work two jobs. And that, that kind of changes the experience they have. Uh, but so we are very cognizant of our student population and trying to serve them the best way that we can. Uh, another way to look at our student population, we have a more <clears throat> mature student population than, than is typical on traditional campus. Even though these numbers are going down, you see the average age of our graduate is 25. So obviously we are serving uh, some older adults as well as the traditional students when they graduate when they're 22. Uh, one of the fastest uh, growing populations on our campus are military veterans. Uh, we have more than 1,500 veterans or dependents uh, on our campus currently, which is the most in the UW system. And so we are really doing a lot. We, we recently opened a new veteran center and we're, we have been designated a military friendly campus. And this is a population that we still uh, are trying to, to uh, find ways to better serve to help them be successful. Uh, and I kind of want to start uh, this morning to show a brief video about what our uh, Chancellor of the Veterans. Very well. Patrick Leon. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. My mom, Denise. Hi, Denise. How are you? My wife and children are going to be in the state class. Oh, fantastic. So. I'm still kind of wrapping my own head around why I, I want to do this so much, in part because I don't necessarily enjoy running. And I certainly not like runners like the Chancellor. At some point over the past year, I just decided that I wanted to run on graduation morning. I got an email from Patrick about three or four weeks ago, and he asked me to, if I would be willing to do a commencement run for him from the War Memorial up to Space Plaza. And I run every day, so I thought, boy, what a great idea that would be to, to kind of honor him and what he's accomplished to be able to do this run. I grew up in South Portland, Maine. I should have graduated high school in 1994. I didn't graduate for any better reason than I just wasn't really focused at the time and not ready to, to finish high school. Uh, I enlisted in the Marines from there, decided to go over to the Army Reserve. Had three deployments, two of those to Iraq, one most recently to Afghanistan. Uh, in between that first and second deployment, I decided I wanted to go back and start school. So at 30, I started at MATC, went to Iraq, came back, and started at UWM from when I started at MATC to graduation will be seven and a half years. This is Chancellor Lobo. How are you doing? This is Noah. How are you doing, Noah? He's like so many students here at UWM that take a non-traditional path to get through the degree and just the accomplishments that he's gone through to, to be here today. He's a small family, two young kids, and just really he's just a remarkable story, and so I just wanted to be part of his day. I couldn't have had a better experience anywhere. I've had just some fantastic teachers, student advisors, faculty advisors. Anytime I've gone in there and sat down and come up with a plan for I'm leaving school or now I'm coming back and I couldn't appreciate it anymore. College isn't easy. I think sometimes, especially some of us who are in the military, we kind of tell each other, well, if I can do the military, then, then college is easy. They're, they're both pretty challenging. It's a journey. You know, like today's run is like what Patrick went through to get here today. It was, it was a long journey, and it was difficult at times. And I just think we all are very proud of him and what he's accomplished, and surely what he's going to be accomplishing in the future. All right, gentlemen. Good morning, sir. Accepted an offer at Rockwell Automation um, back in February. You know, I, I knew that's where I wanted to be, and so I, I made every effort to to get there and thankfully I did. You can do it. And you know, sometimes you just need a reminder of that. You know, to kind of go and finish you know, a seven and a half year run and that's about the best I can put in. So the great thing about the Patrick's story is as he, as he told, he was a he didn't even graduate high school. 
and he was able to find his way to UWM and, and graduate in seven and a half years. And for me, it was such an inspiring story. You know, he's got two very young children, a, a young family, and um, he had to overcome a lot to get his degree. You know, he had three tours uh, to go through. And um, it really shows uh, the type of students that we have and, and the unique perspective that we can offer here in the UW system. And I couldn't be prouder of him. He, uh, he got a dream job at Rockwell. He's, he's already started his, his, his work. And I just think he's going to be accomplishing great things, and we're all going to be very proud of him going forward. So um, we talked about how our student body is changing. I think the other part of our transformation is, is all of you are probably aware of the physical transformation. Um, in the past 22 years, this campus has done $320 million in, in capital projects. Today, we're doing $300 million. So we're changing as fast as, as doing as much today as we've done in the last 22 years. And part of this expansion of the growth of our campus is the fact that we are the second densest campus in the country in terms of students' acreage ratio. So we've had to move off our campus. And so uh, this picture just shows a picture of Milwaukee of all the places that we're doing work and we're moving forward. So to me, it's... Um, Really excited to see the fact that we're moving off the footprint of our campus. And wherever we go, it's really nice because there's development that happens around us. So we're actually not just transforming the physical space for our students and faculty to help them be successful, but we're also helping them transform Milwaukee. Uh, those of you who probably remember last June, uh, we actually opened the, the Zuberl School of Public Health. I'm happy to say that the students and faculty have moved in. Uh, we have uh, Actually, our first uh, graduating class was this year, and so we're very excited about the labs going in, the classrooms going in there. Uh, just this past Tuesday, uh, we had a press conference there where we opened a social innovation lab where uh, we had a set of students that had developed an app uh, from Milwaukee County for in terms of um, <coughs> for tracking where the buses are. So in your bus stop, you'll, you'll know where the, where the buses are, how long they're going to be there. Also, uh, the park system, making reservations. So it was a, re a really neat thing happening there last Tuesday. I believe all of you are also aware of what's going on in our School of Public Health. Uh, this, uh, we had the, the, the pile driving last, uh, last June at the Regents meeting. Uh, that project is now about 23% completed. It will be done in October 2014. Uh, it's great. It's too late to go down there now. You know, the construction site is actually coming up out of the grounds, and it's, it's very exciting for all of us to see that great transformation happening so that we just won't be the, the first school of special water science in the country, but we're the best uh, with state-of-the-art labs and classrooms for our students and faculty. And for the first time in 18 years, there's actually a crane on our campus. If you happen to, to look out to the west of, of this building today, uh, the Kenwood IRC, uh, <coughs> we, we broke ground in October. And uh, it'll be the first campus building, uh, academic building on our campus in, in over 18 years since our Lubar School of Business was completed. Uh, this will be transformational for us. Again, this is going to be the home uh, for our core sciences. The physics department will be over there, but also uh, biology, chemistry, uh, engineering, and uh, some of our public health wet lab folks will be there. So it's really exciting for us to see this, this building that's going to allow us to be more competitive on a national scale going up. Uh, we also, as many of you know, back in December 2010, we purchased the Columbia St. Mary's Hospital. Again, this will be something that really helps us decompress as a campus. We talked about how, how dense we are. Uh, this is uh, 11 buildings and 828,000 square feet. Uh, we have a lot going on in the building already. Uh, <clears throat> we expect to have another $45 million in renovations over the next biennial budget. Uh, our, our Children's Center will be moving over there. Our Honors College is already there. We have about 400 faculty there. Uh, we hope to be moving some of our School of Education and our College of Health Sciences there as well. So it's just uh, really exciting for us to have some space on our campus. I just talk about this as being the canvas we're going to paint on for the next decade. And for many of you uh, also know, the, maybe our most ambitious, ambitious project is what's going on in Mission Campus. And for those of you who are not uh, available to be there last night when we had the beam raising, uh, we have a short video that kind of highlights what the evening was like. What a great turnout. This is uh, just so excited to see this group here. Tonight is really an event that is a great milestone for Innovation Campus here at UWM. And as I went around the room this evening and talked to everyone, I heard so many times that this was a dream five or six years ago. And today we can say it's a reality by putting that last beam up. And today's update, it's critical to help businesses consider new technologies, new processes, and innovative products which will help expand their commercial reach in a global economy. I'm confident that the partnerships that you've formed between local government, academia, and the business community will provide long-term balance to the region's overall economic growth strategy by creating a stronghold for regional competitiveness.
Milwaukee has a great heritage in power electronics, and it became a very easy decision to locate here. We see a great opportunity for the intersection of what ABB does, its human capital, its research development, and what UWM and the Innovation Campus represents to the area. So thank you to everybody who contributed, and we look forward to a long and fruitful relationship. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And this is an example, this, this project is an example of that. This campus is the perfect synergy of research and industry, academic and medical practice for new business and innovation, hence the name, why we're here today. It is a great day in Milwaukee County when you have a building like this being built. It's even a better day when the building that's being built is all about business and job creation. I want to thank everyone who had even any small part in getting us to today because this is a great accomplishment for the region. I really hope that they'll be inviting you to many more groundbreakings and beam raisings and ribbon cuttings over the next several years as this project really begins to take off. Now, for those of you who weren't able to be there last night, there was uh, just so much positive energy in the room. It was, it was really exciting. And I think part of that is because that so many people have been part of the Innovation Campus and in getting us uh, off the ground and where we're going. And just from a personal perspective, I think you saw I got to actually drive the crane and raise the beam uh, myself, which was a, a personal, it was like a childhood dream come true. And um, the evening, actually, I have to say, the, the evening got even better. I, I went to dinner with Michael Cudahy after dinner, and he has a Tesla. And if you don't, don't know what Tesla, it goes from zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. And he actually let me drive it to dinner. So it was like... <laughs> I was like, I got two things off the bucket list in one night. So, so I, I think the, uh, the, the, this is a good segue, uh, talking about the Innovation Campus and what the accelerator building that we laid the last beam up is going forward, talking about innovation in entrepreneurship and developing an ecosystem here in Milwaukee. And um, one of the great partners we have, actually, is the Greater Milwaukee Committee and Julie Taylor. And I always say that if you take a look at the root of any of the great things that are going on in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship in Milwaukee, Julia is, is, is at, the, at the root of what's happening. And so uh, we invite you here today to talk a little bit about what's happening here in Milwaukee for those of you who aren't here on uh, the ground day to day to see all the exciting things happening to tell you, you know, how Milwaukee is changing and transforming as well. So, Julia? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, and that was a great event at Innovation Campus last night, and I was very impressed with the way you set that I-beam. That was great. Uh, the Greater Milwaukee Committee has actually been around in Milwaukee since the 40s. Uh, over the years, we've done things like build stadiums, zoos, uh, create regional medical complexes. But in recent uh, years, our big focus has been on education, uh, economic development, and effective government. Some of our recent projects have included the formation of Milwaukee 7, uh, the Water Council, and then uh, also we've worked a great deal on uh, entrepreneurship with BizStarts. Uh, over the last two years, um, we've worked very closely with UWM on uh, getting another project up and going called Mike. And Mike is really playing off the strength of innovation in the region. We have a lot of global headquartered companies here, and one of the things they really need is innovative talent and breakthrough uh, strategies. I sat through a conference uh, about two weeks ago where Jeff Immelt spoke for about an hour and a half about spending 2012 just with startups and uh, what they could learn from them in terms of market intensity and speed. We're trying to bring that same thing here with Mike of really uh, taking what's happening out there in the entrepreneurial community, the startup community, and finding ways to better connect them in with the corporate community. Uh, UWM has also played a really important role. Uh, they are fostering a very significant startup culture here at UWM. It's something that our corporate community is very interested in and wants to continue to foster. Uh, one other big thing that happened, and you know, at some point we'll probably say Mike was named after Mike because he's been so engaged in it. Uh, we also bring in speakers externally to, to talk about what's going on around the globe in innovation. And he suggested bringing in a gentleman named Dan Eisenberg from Babson College about a year ago. He spoke to our membership, spoke to the Mike Council. He was impressed with Milwaukee. We were impressed with him. And about a year ago, uh, we had an opportunity to, um, through American Express sponsorship, uh, actually at the end of the year, to invite Dan to come in and look at building out the innovation entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Milwaukee. 
Uh, he's done this around the globe. This is the first U.S. city he's participating in, and it's been a really great experience to look at what are the barriers and how do we better align our assets, go from a fragmented approach to a very aligned approach to leverage what we've got. And all the way through this, uh, Mike Lovell and UWM have been significant players in both helping raise funding, uh, provide the direction, and really make this happen. And it's very, I think it's very honest to say we would not have scale up here in Milwaukee if it wasn't for Mike uh, bringing it to our attention and UWM's involvement. They're also providing some uh, part-time staff time to help staff it. That's greatly appreciated. Uh, a big thing that we've learned through both Mike as well as Scale Up is where are these barriers? And a couple of them that come out are we need to better align our research and our startup communities. And I see what UWM is doing as a real model of how we can start to align that even better with our corporate community. The continuum of capital is another big issue. Um, we know that at the very pre-seed, the ideation stage in the seed area, we don't have a lot of capital. We have a pretty robust angel, uh, angel fund marketplace. And we don't have any of what's called the Valley of Death, which is Series A funding. And uh, we lose a lot of startups outside of this area because they have to go to the coast to find that funding, and the investors want them close by. So we're also working with UWM closely to look at how do we fill those gaps, either through attracting private investors here, and we are having VCs coming in from New York and uh, Chicago, spending time with Mike and I, trying to make the pitch for why they need to invest in the startups here in Milwaukee. Uh, but it's a very pivotal time for Milwaukee, and certainly the investment that the regions have made in Milwaukee's recent projects are really important, and certainly taking a look at continued investment and innovation in startups is going to be very important to the Milwaukee business community. Uh, I want to also leave you, we've got uh, some brochures on your table. Another big part of innovation is uh, building up a national image. And we've worked hard with, this is our South by Southwest flying car. This is our innovation week. We've had events going on all week. We've got people here from Kentucky, L.A., New York. Um, we had people in from Austin that have actually relocated here recently from Austin, from Boston, from Malibu. Uh, so there is something start happening here. One of the guys with the startups uh, was telling me, and he's a gentleman that's been around, and he's probably in his third startup. He said there really is something happening here. We just got to make sure that we feed it, we foster it, and we protect it. And so um, we're really excited to be working with UWM and moving forward on this, and uh, excited uh, especially to have leadership here at UWM that really understands the startup culture and the community and the difference it can make to us in Milwaukee. So thank you. Well, thank you, Julia, and I, I hope you take a lot of uh, pride in what's going on because you're really at the, the, the forefront of these efforts. And I will just reiterate, there's really something special going on in Milwaukee right now. For those of us who are here, we can kind of feel it. Um, one of the things that, you know, we're getting some national recognition for what's happening. Uh, we, Milwaukee just topped the list of uh, the most surprising high-tech uh, city in, in the country from tech.com. And uh, recently, Forbes listed Milwaukee as one of the 15 top emerging uh, cities in the U.S. And she mentioned Scale Up Milwaukee. And again, this is a major initiative in terms of really coalesce what's going on. There's two things I think are very significant that show where Milwaukee's heading about the scale up. Uh, the first is that Dan Eisenberg, is, as Julie had said, has been developing ecosystems around the world, but he's not done one in the U.S. He picked Milwaukee as his first city to do one of these efforts. And obviously, he wouldn't have picked Milwaukee if it wasn't successful. Likewise, American Express, who was funding this effort, this is the first venture that they've had into uh, community uh, economic development, and they chose Milwaukee for an investment. So I think both of those things say something that really gets to the genesis that there is something from the grassroots building up here. But uh, the reality is, I think we all know, that we have a long way to go. Uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, uh, 2012 numbers about the top cities for tech startups uh, in 2011, uh, San Francisco had over 3,000, Boston 700, New York uh, 1,800. Uh, these, you know, we are pale in comparison. You know, we just had 13 in 2012, so we still really have a long way to go. And I will, con will say, and I think all of you agree with me, that any region that is experiencing major economic growth, if you look at the map up there where the dots are, there is a major research institution that's helping drive that growth. And so I can just tell you, UWM wants to be that driver for Milwaukee. And I think 
I think Milwaukee and the state needs us to be that driver. So what's critical for us as a campus, and we all recognize, is we need to develop pathways for innovation across our campus, both for students and for faculty. And so one of the things that we did, uh, uh, Shell Lubar and I went to Babson College a year ago last December because Babson is ranked first in the, um, in the country for 19 straight years in entrepreneurship in the U.S. News and World Report. And what we found there was just, a, was just amazing, the culture they had there for starting up companies and creating entrepreneurship for their students, even to the point where the freshman year, uh, the first class that students take, uh, they're in a classroom of 80, and every student, the day they walk in the door, has to come up with an idea for their company they're going to start and how they're going to produce the product. And each week, the students present their ideas, and half of them are eliminated. And the students that get eliminated then choose which companies they work for. So by the end of the class, all of these students are working for a company. And lo and behold, um, they actually produced the, the products by the end of the semester. And when we were there, uh, one of the companies from the former years had reached a million dollars. Matter of fact, they have a wall of fame where they had 45 or 50 of these student teams from this class had achieved a million dollars in sales. And so uh, it was really exciting for us to find out then there's also a workshop at Babson uh, that faculty can be sent uh, to, uh, to learn the Babson model. So I took, uh, when I came back, I, uh, in January they have this workshop for faculty. Uh, I took faculty from, we asked faculty from across campus, from, I think from seven different schools and colleges, you know, wanting to learn about the Babson model. And what they came back with was a great idea, primarily led by one of our faculty, Ilya Avdiv, in what is known as the Student Startup Challenge. And uh, I think this is, again, this is just one pathway, but we all need to recognize that 54% of the millennial generation, those currently in college, either want to work for themselves or start their own company. So not only do they want to be agree on our campuses, but they also want to start their own venture while they're here. And I want to kind of introduce the Student Startup Challenge and talk a little bit about it, uh, again, through another video. What you doing? Uh, trying to figure out why it doesn't work anymore. I knew that the mobile app, that it had to go somewhere. We have these two right now, and tonight we're going to turn this pile of stuff into hundreds more of them. No strings attached to money. That's the best thing any entrepreneur can ask for. And uh, we thought, okay, maybe we'll get a dozen of ideas. Really, this is an outgrowth of Ilya saying, well, we've got this class where outside companies can come with their ideas, give them to our students, and they're building these great prototypes. What about student ideas? How can we support those with this system we already have in place? The only thing that was kind of missing is a framework that would allow students to make it happen. So we just added a tiny little thing, and just then we stepped out of the way and let the students uh, take over. Creations is my partner in my company. We were selling 3D printers. The problem with 3D printing is, is generating that actual object that you want to print. So the fastest way is to take an existing object and scan it. You know, in the future, it, it's a no-brainer. They're going to have 3D copy machines, essentially. So, you know, we want to be part of developing that future. And you can zoom in. You can even see into the grooves of the ball. I participated in a product realization class last semester. My sponsor was TAPCO. Traffic and parking controls wanted to develop a mobile phone parking availability app. What we did was we took it one step further. We understood that there is an, a need for a mobile wireless vehicle detection hardware platform and that kind of spawned into a business idea. So it just couldn't die. And without the startup challenge, I don't think it really would have turned into what it could be or is about to be. Well, I wanted to create a system that uses the spatial reasoning skills that we've already developed, a 3D modeling environment that isn't a mouse and a keyboard and a computer screen, but that's physical objects that you build together. This is actually a system that you could have on a table and have 10, 15 people all working on it at the same time. Everyone on the Clever Blocks team really sees Clever Blocks as a starting point. Right now, it's smart Legos, but that may become 
smart clay or smart paper, ways that are accessible to more people. What the university is doing by focusing on startups is historically critical. We're in an economy that's trying to create jobs. I've never seen a university on steroids when it comes to entrepreneurship, like I've seen it at UWM. We want to go into the union and see students talking about their ideas, talking about doing something. The innovation begins in a coffee shop, in a lab, in a library, when people actually develop their ideas. You want to see successful entrepreneurs walking among us, and they would become our champions and ambassadors. I think this really speaks to the faith that UWM has in its students. We are interested in long-term investment in what Milwaukee can do, and that's represented by our students. We're creating student innovators, and that's the real gain out of the Student Startup Challenge. I think when you give the students a challenge like that, they'll rise up to the occasion. I'm going to take my measurements tonight. I don't know if it would have even been conceived of without the Startup Challenge. You know that you're participating in something that could really turn, turn out to be great. So just a couple of things also to, to give more context. So the, the three student teams out of the 61 that won the competition, they got $10,000 to develop the product and launch their company. But we also scaffolded those student teams in the fall and spring semesters. They actually worked with other students in other courses to actually develop the prototype. And actually, uh, so in the, in the fall semester, they worked with engineering and, and art students to build the prototype and create them. And in the uh, spring semester, they worked with business students to develop the business plan and launch their company. So not just touch the students that won the competition, but the students who were in those courses that helped them uh, develop the companies as well. And the, uh, the success already, we're already seeing it. Uh, of the first two sets of uh, teams, that, um, the first three teams that uh, we launched, uh, two of them have already won uh, business plan competitions to get additional funding uh, for their products, so obviously uh, for their, for their uh, startups. Also, uh, one of the great things uh, that uh, we've also found that this program is really best in class in the country. Uh, we've been able to get both national support from the NCIA, National Collegiate Invaders Alliance, and we're very blessed to also get a UW system grant uh, for the growth agenda. Um, so instead of only three teams uh, this coming year, we just finished our RFP and we had 56 teams apply for round two, but we are actually going to be able to fund uh, 10 to 12 teams this year, so we're very excited uh, that we were able to, to fund more teams and uh, hopefully have uh, better products. So uh, as I mentioned before, one of the things that uh, we are trying to do on our campus is not just help students attain their degrees and be successful in the classroom. We're also trying to scaffold them and help them be successful as they try to launch their own ventures. I think this represents a new breed of students. As I said before, 54% of students today uh, want to work for themselves. And I really think uh, the person who represents that best on our campus is the next individual, Carlton Reeves, who is... Um, He's president of, of Reef Technology and Tally Payments uh, here uh, at, in, in Milwaukee, and he's also a PhD candidate. So he's, I'm going to have him say a few words kind of about his pathway uh, to how he got here. Good morning. Well, um, like Dr. Lovell said, uh, my name is Carlton Reeves, and I'm a uh, fourth-year PhD student uh, here at UWM in the Mechanical Engineering Department. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, my academic achievement and how I got my startup going, uh, Tally Payments, the smarter way to order and pay. Um, so I'm originally from Boston, and when I went to college, I went to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There I studied mechanical engineering and business administration. Um, during my time at Carnegie Mellon, I got to work on the Google Lunar X Prize, where I worked with a team of students and researchers to send a robot from Earth to the moon to take high-definition video footage of the Apollo landing sites. And we actually had to stream that video footage back to Earth. So that's an ongoing project, and I got to work on it for a couple of years while I was at CMU. Um, when I was at CMU, I realized that, you know, during that project, I was working on world-class research. And when I left Carnegie Mellon, I left with a, ba with a master's degree in mechanical engineering and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, and I decided to come to UWM for their tribology program. UWM, unknown to many of you, may, has one of the largest tribology programs, arguably, in the U.S., with over 14 faculty members studying tribology. And for those who don't know, tribology is the study of friction, lubrication, and wear. 
In my PhD, I, I develop environmentally friendly biolubricants for energy conservation and sustainability. At UWM, this research has allowed me to uh, win numerous academic awards. Um, I, I've, I won the Chancellor's Award three years in a row. I was able to also win the uh, student, uh, re the student graduate research competition here at UWM, and that was just internal to the, to the College of Engineering. I also won the research poster symposium at our International Joint Tribology Conference, and that's our largest annual conference uh, in tribology every year. I also was ranked third. Pl I also won third place by the National Science Foundation for my work in uh, uh, tribology at the International Mechanical Engineering Congress and Exposition. So even here at UWM, I'm still able to. Uh, participate in world-class research, and, that's, and that research is recognized both nationally and internationally. So not only did UWM help me achieve academic success, but it also allowed me to achieve entrepreneurial success. I got my start with my company Tally Payments right here at UWM. In fact, we first, I first got involved in entrepreneurship when I entered the, new, the Lubar School of Business New Venture Business Plan Competition, where we placed second place. I then entered the BizStarts Milwaukee business plan competition, and I also won second place. From there, I went back to UWM, and they funded, me, my, fund, they funded my business through the Scheinfeld Entrepreneur Fund. From that point on, I also entered the Miller Coors Urban Entrepreneur Business Plan Competition, which is a national competition. That competition allowed us to be placed top 10 in the U.S. for my startup, Tally Payments. So in nine months, I went from an idea to building a team with many of my teammates and business partners sitting in the back over there to launching a product. And we're launching this product this June in Milwaukee. And what's astonishing is we're launching it in approximately 60 venues with thousands of users and we've already received national attention. Just the other day we were doing a diagnostic test of our system and we literally had thousands of users and orders coming through our system from all over the U.S. from Boston to Chicago to Milwaukee to San Francisco and San Diego. So you can see that there's a lot of demand, and that was literally in 15 minutes when we were just doing a server check. So in nine months, I went from an idea to a business, and all with the support of UWM behind me. And imagine where I can go in nine more months with UWM and all this innovation going on on campus and around the Milwaukee area. So let me get into my business a little bit. So what is Tally Payments? Tally Payments is an electronic payment service for restaurants where customers can view menus, place orders, and pay all right there on their mobile device. Not only that, we also provide restaurants and bars with a tablet-based point-of-sale system where they can actually receive these orders. We allow restaurants to have uh, faster wait, lower wait times or faster wait times, more tables get served, and actually increase their sales. We've had, over the last nine months, we've had over 500 students using our system on or around campus. And four out of five of those students have indicated to us that they actually want to use mobile ordering and use tally payments on campus and around the, the restaurants and coffee shops right here in Milwaukee. And we're getting ready to sign and launch a lot of those businesses right here in the city. So soon enough, you'll be able to use your phone to pay for all your items. Tally payments is literally convenience in the palm of your hands. You simply place your order on your mobile device, and we send it right to the restaurant where you can then pick up your food and beverage item. So what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about ambitions, not dreams. I'm talking about the fact that you know, I am a UWM PhD student and an entrepreneur. It is possible to do both. I'm talking about the idea that I want to create internships for, for opportunities where students here, undergraduate and graduate students, can have the same opportunities that I had when I was at Carnegie Mellon working on the Google Lunar X Prize. And I want to keep my business here. I want to have, you know, have, create jobs in Wisconsin where Yep, sorry. Where uh, I can have, um, you know, have my business located here, and I also want to have internships for uh, opportunities for students. And finally, I want to see growth within Wisconsin, where I can have my business stay here, and I can actually see that my business can compete against other companies, other companies, other tech companies in Wisconsin, in Boston, in New York, in California. And I believe that my business is on the verge of being able to nationally compete with some of these businesses. So. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to see exposure for UWM, where UWM becomes synonymous with success. Thank you. I also wanted to say, um, for some of you, 
I know the Regents received this flyer, this pamphlet that kind of talks a little bit about my business and what we're trying to do. Um, we also left a few other pamphlets in the back for you to pick up if you'd like to uh, just kind of get to know what, what my project is about and some of the students working involved. So um, we'll be around after this if you guys would like to talk to us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Carlton. And I think all of you can see why we're so proud of him and what he's accomplishing. Now, we've talked a little bit about how we're developing pathways for students uh, to be more innovative and entrepreneurial. Well, we're doing the same thing for faculty and staff on our campus. Uh, back in 2006, UWM launched a research foundation. And as many of you are aware, um, UWM was, uh, had, was supported by WISIS in the past. Uh, but it was clear uh, that we needed an organization on the ground here to take advantage of all the exciting uh, research and intellectual property that was being generated. Uh, so they're making sure we were taking advantage and were fully supporting the campus. And so when we launched the Research Foundation, it was really, was the primary focus was supporting innovation on partnership, but also, uh, it also fosters public-private partnerships and leveraging IP and has really helped spin off uh, technologies. And I'm going to show in a second, you know, what the impact is that has been on our campus. But some of the activities, just as an example of some of the programs, uh, the Research Foundation has launched a, a um, Catalyst Grant program where we've gotten money from uh, GE Healthcare, the Hertzfeld Foundation, Bradley Foundation, Rockwell Automation, to take technology <clears throat> that has a high potential for commercialization research, high potential for commercialization, and, and fund that research. And they've actually funded fi uh, about 52 different grants and raised about $3 million for this program. And it's not the sole reason, but one of, it's one of the reasons why uh, there's been a lot of follow-up grants from those Catalyst grants and a lot of intellectual property developed. But over the last decade, we've almost doubled our research on this campus. We've had a 92% increase you know, in our funding, and so that we've won from 31 to 59 million. You know, so we're on a great trajectory in terms of the research that's going on, uh, growth on our campus. Uh, but I think what's more important to say back in 2006, and actually this was uh, when I arrived here in 2008, the very first person I met with was Brian Thompson, who leads the Research Foundation. Um, I, I lunched with him during my first interview here when I was uh, being interviewed for engineering dean. And I said, I remember asking Brian, well, Brian, uh, how many uh, patents do you have? We said, we, well, we have one. So how many licenses have you done? We haven't done any. How many startups have you launched? He said, we haven't had any. And so that was a starting point in 2008. And if you fast forward to where we are today, uh, which is really exciting, uh, all of these little dots, I don't expect anybody to see this, these, these are faces of our faculty on our campus that have uh, intellectual property at one stage in the continuum on our campus. We've gone from that one dot, which we showed back in 2008, to well over 100 different faculty and staff technologies being either patented or licensed. You know, literally we've had, we've now have dozens of licensed technology. Uh, we've had six or seven startup companies that we've launched. So it's very, very exciting to see this explosion. There's no way to describe it. There's something happening here in terms of uh, innovation. It's almost like a nuclear bomb went off in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation, in terms of faculty and staff. It's just so exciting for me to see, see that we have so many people engaged in the activities that Brian is, is putting forward. Uh, one example of this, uh, and just shows you, you're, you, know, you always think about uh, entrepreneurship and innovation potentially happening in the sciences or engineering. Well, as it turns out, our most successful uh, endeavor to date actually came out of our School of Social Work. Uh, this is a product uh, that has been a uh, company that's been launched by uh, Ronda Montgomery, an endowed chair uh, in applied gerontology. Um, and she's launched something called T-Care. And what T-Care is, it's a, it's a software product that matches caregivers for the aging with the appropriate services. So it helps people taking care of the elderly make decisions that are most appropriate uh, for uh, the people that they're serving. Uh, and what it's found is that only is the, um, does it help save health care costs, especially in the long run, but it also reduces the stress le level, particularly for the caregiver, you know, when they go through some very difficult decision-making process. Now, her product uh, to date, uh, again, which was um, launched in August 2012, is now currently being used by six different states. It's being licensed in six different states. Uh, and she's presently negotiating with uh, some private insurers, uh, accountable care, organizations, some self-insured employers, and some federal agencies. So clearly, um, her product is, is really, it's, it's only been maybe uh, about 10 months since this launch has happened, and it's clearly taking off, and we're very proud of what Rhonda has been able to accomplish. And uh, the Research Foundation and Brian Thompson, the way he's been able to support her in terms of her endeavor to start her own company. And finally, when we talk about uh, research growth and what we're trying to do on our campus, uh, we all recognize that 
Certainly, you know, uh, in terms of research, we are still very small with respect to the other research institution in the state, which is Madison. And uh, we know that as we try to grow our research and to attain our goals of being a major research university, we can't do it in the same way Madison did. Madison had a 150-year head start on us uh, with significant investment from the state uh, to get there. And we know that going forward, the state uh, is not going to be able to invest the same way in Milwaukee as in Madison. So one of the ways we can do things is through partnerships. And um, I think one of the things that we're very proud of is the way that we are partnering with local industry to really bring more resources to our campus to do more research that is relevant to the companies here and actually add values to the companies that we are partnering with. And I think the key is here, you know, by sharing resources and aligning together with others, uh, you can accomplish more with less. I have a video from Delta Controls I'll show you now. It's actually pretty sweet. I turned it on, didn't even know it started. This car I'm driving right now, it's a plug-in electric vehicle. It's actually powered by uh, one of Johnson Control's lithium-ion batteries. Yeah, it's a pretty sweet vehicle. I wish I had it, but can't afford it just yet. Uh, I applied to probably about 10 schools. I chose uh, UWM for the partnership. I saw that they were partnered with Johnson Controls, and that together would be something that's very unique. People are very surprised at the level of high-tech research and development that is going on. And particularly, they're also surprised by the partnership. The opportunity for universities to work more closely together with industry partners opens up opportunities to be able to more successfully take technology from the laboratory ultimately into the product. What really excites me is seeing um, the UWM students and the UW students who are working inside the labs that we, we put in place, collaborating and having you know, our scientists that are their mentors. So this is our electrochemistry lab. And what we're able to do up here is come up with a technology breakthrough at a very small scale, right around a coin cell level, looking at different elements, how we can mix this together, the different ratios, and really hoping for that high payoff in terms of energy density for the future. Since we work with lithium, it's very reactive. We make sure that the moisture level inside the glove box is as low as possible. Most universities are not set up for that, so we're actually lucky that we are able to have this box. A coin cell is really a, a proof of concept where the pouch cell would actually be the product that we're going to build. Once we have that technology breakthrough, what we're able to do is take that downstairs to our dry room and we're able to scale that up. And this dry lab capability located right here on campus is one that uh, really doesn't exist in university environments. Johnson Controls provides, I think, a, a grounding in some sense for the applied research that the faculty are doing. So we integrate our technology to apply to real production. Milwaukee is, is focused on the basic electrochemistry of the batteries, whereas the work that's going on here extends outward to include how does that battery fit into the, the larger system, whether it goes into a vehicle or whether it goes into a system in support of a wind turbine or whatever it might be. Really, there's not another place in the country that is, is doing it the way that we are. The partnership itself is going to transform uh, our campus and it's going to transform Milwaukee. The fact that you go all the way from the Dow chair uh, to the facilities uh, to uh, the internship opportunities we have for our students, I just think it's second to none. It's creating an environment to get that next technology breakthrough and being able to accelerate its commercialization. Having researchers from industry and, and from academia work together is, is really a critical endeavor in order to succeed in answering those questions about what energy is going to look like in the future. It's pretty awesome. I would not want to be anywhere else because what I'm doing is definitely like changing the future and hopefully changing the battery world. So I often describe this partnership with Johnson Controls as the one that I've been most proud of in my career. It's the deepest relationship I've ever had. I want to highlight a couple of things that kind of the video uh, shows. The first is the student Ryan Hickey. As you heard, he applied to 10 different schools. Um, he, uh, including, he got, he got into Duke, Northwestern, Madison, but he chose to come to UWM because he knew his pathway to his future, where he'd be successful, was at UWM because of this partnership. 
So we're attracting better students uh, because of these partnerships, because they know that they'll have a job uh, when they graduate. Uh, the benefits to U UWM are really uh, just amazing. You can imagine being a student. We have 27 students currently working in the lab. Uh, they have facilities that they otherwise couldn't. They're being trained and mentored by not only our faculty, but by uh, Johnson Control scientists, so that they will have a skill set when they graduate where they'll make them marketable uh, throughout the country. But to date, every student that's graduated worked through the program is now employed by Johnson Controls. They've hired everyone. Um, think about our, what it means for our faculty. Um, those, the, the facilities that you saw you know, on the video were all put in by Johnson Controls. Uh, they paid for those on our campus, millions of dollars in investment. In fact, the dry room, which is a battery prototyping and testing facility, is the largest in the Western Hemisphere. It is the only one in an academic institution in the U.S. and is the best in the country. Our National Labs comes to use our lab because we have the best one in the country. We could not have had those facilities on our campus without this partnership. Our faculty are also more successful. They have colleagues from Johnson uh, Controls uh, that they can work side by side and work with on, on scientific problems. Johnson Controls, in addition to the partnership, is putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year into research. So they actually put an RFP out for their 10 top technology problems that they're trying to solve in a given year and putting funding behind for our faculty. So what's the benefit of Johnson Controls? Well, they talk about how they've had much greater return on investment uh, just because of the technology that's been developed here and the talent that's being developed. The students that are working in labs, that's a pipeline of the next set of leaders with New Johnson Controls. They're, they're really training uh, their next generation of employees. Uh, I mentioned before, what's really unique about this partnership is there are currently 16 PhD scientists from Johnson Controls who have their offices and their labs in their engineering school. When they come to work, they don't go to Johnson Controls, they come here. They have adjunct appointments, they're helping teach our students, they have, they're helping uh, teach courses with us, they're mentoring and training our students. Those 16 uh, scientists, PhD scientists that Johnson Controls has here, would not have come to Milwaukee if it hadn't been for the partnership. What's really unique is they are like their faculty on a college campus, but they're working for a company, and that's very appealing to the individuals. So they've been able to recruit scientists from around the world, all over the world, from Europe, from Asia, uh, and from across the U.S. to be here uh, because this is a unique environment. So they are really bringing talent into the organization uh, through the partnership as well. And finally, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the successes uh, that we've had in this to show that really this is a mo national model for the future. Well, the first is, is that uh, part of this uh, project includes a project from the Department of Energy and the very first battery that we, pro we produced uh, through this partnership, the, the first uh, cell pack that we produced, uh, they sent to the Department of Energy, and it exceeded you know, their expectations so much they didn't believe the results. They said, produce 30 more, we're going to have them independently tested. Well, they did. They sent those 30 out, and sure enough, they all were at the same level as the first battery produced. And the bat first battery produced is now the standard for the Department of Energy and lithium-ion batteries, which with anybody else gets compared to. Uh, also, the last time I was in the lab, about a month ago, I was talking to a Korean scientist, and he showed me a lithium sulfur battery, which is the next generation beyond lithium-ion that had three times the energy density of the greatest uh, lithium-ion battery that's available today. I knew at that point the next technology breakthrough in batteries is going to happen on our campus here in those labs, which is very exciting. And so I talked a little bit about this being the model for the future. Um, I think that when you talk about uh, the federal funding that we've been able to attract, uh, our scientists, our, our faculty and the scientists on controls over the last year have brought in $35 million in federal grants for this partnership. But the amazing thing is we have a 92% success rate on those federal grants. As many of you know, the typical success rate is between 5 and 10%. We're at 92. And this has garnered us a lot of attention, uh, both uh, nationally. Uh, we, we recently won... Uh, uh, two award, one local and one uh, national. We won an Edison, a gold prize in the Edison Award for a partnership. Now, if those of you who are not familiar with the Edison Award, this is a big deal. This is like an Oscar for innovation, and we won the gold prize. And the only other institution in the country that was part of uh, an Edison Award this year was Carnegie Mellon University. So we were only two, but we actually won the gold prize. We also won locally the Business Journal. I am, I'm also asked now to go talk to my colleagues do the success of our program around the country. Other universities want to know how we did this partnership and how they can replicate it, so we're really showing that we're doing something that's unique. And we're using this model now, uh, this starting with Johnson Controls, we're using it with other organizations within the region to have the same level of partnership and really have fruitful relationships. We recently announced in the past year, GE Healthcare is investing $3 million uh, into a partnership with us around computational imaging. One of the challenges they have is that people do, do can re reconstruct um, images with all the data they're able to generate uh, through their imaging equipment uh, 
you need software engineers, and it's very hard to get those engineers with the skills that they need because most of them are on the coast. And so they thought they'd invest in us to not only uh, help develop technology to better reconstruct the images with our faculty, but also develop a pipeline of students uh, that they would then employ. Similarly, Rockwell Automation is investing in supply chain management for us, really trying to <clears throat> help not only us in the region uh, develop uh, significant um, research and technology and have student growth around supply chains is very important uh, for many organizations uh, to, to be efficient around supply chain, which the skill set is, is, is lacking many times. Uh, another thing that I think I want to point out, one of the key things about the Johnson Controls model, which I believe both what we're doing at Innovation Campus and also around the water area is co-location. When you have uh, students and faculty co-located with uh, people working from industry, that's when true technology transfer and innovation can take place. So we're very proud of the fact that in the Global Water Center, which will be opening this August here in Milwaukee down in the Fifth Ward, uh, we're going to be a major tenant. We're one of the anchors uh, there. We also have uh, some other large, we have A.O. Smith, uh, Veolia, uh, Badger Meter will also be there. But what's really exciting about this project is this project, um, this seven-story building, which is really a water accelerator, uh, not only is, has these major anchor tenants, but where there's going to be 13 startup companies moving into this location. And the neat thing about this project is that the 13 companies are coming from all over the world. Three companies are coming from France, for example. So this is attracting talent and companies to Milwaukee, and to this partnership. The idea is that by co-locating, sharing resources, being around each other, it's just very exciting for us. And many of you know this is very important because Milwaukee is trying to become one of the three water hubs in the country, along with uh, Sing Singapore and Stockholm and Sweden. And so <clears throat> this building is already fully subscribed and it's not even open yet. And so there's actually companies wanting to be part of this that are actually moving in and they're going to be developing buildings around this. So I believe this will transform the whole fifth ward of Milwaukee. And this kind of gets us to the, um, the, the scaling up of what we're doing. Uh, currently the Johnson Controls is something we're doing on our campus in a couple of labs are building. I believe that the Innovation Campus will be a way to make this maybe 10 or 20 fold increase the kind of activities that we're doing here. And it's very exciting that as you saw from the video yesterday, this is happening. And really just as the model, as we mentioned before, uh, it's a third generation research park. You think about the first generation research park, which was originally the Research Triangle. It's a real estate endeavor where you had companies moving in close proximity to the university. And the second generation is kind of they have Madison where you have university buildings in a research park side by side uh, with uh, the corporate sector. Whereas the third generation, which we're opening Innovation Campus and Accelerate Building is a perfect example, we are not only having universities in industry, but other partners within the building. Uh, so it's a really a third generation research park. So the, the companies that are in the buildings also have IDs and can use the resources from the university. Likewise, the university can use the labs in the industry side. So it's really modeled after Centennial Campus in North Carolina State. Uh, so as we talked about yesterday, the first building is actually will be done about a, uh, less than a year from now in January where we have faculty moving in. I mentioned last night we put our RFP to see how many faculty, uh, to faculty to move into this building once it's done. We had 80 faculty that went into this building. We only have room for 10 to 8 to 10. So obviously our faculty, you know, they'll be more successful by being in this location. Uh, we're also going to be in there with uh, three small startup companies, Concordia, uh, Brooke Stevens, and some other, other companies. And uh, this... This project is uh, the first in my career, I think I mentioned before, that the first initial grant that we asked for was for three and a half million dollars uh, to build this building. It's the first time the federal government came back to me and thought it was such a good idea, they gave us 5.4 million to increase the size of it so we could do one more in the building. So it was a neat experience for me. So I, again, validating that what we're doing is, is pretty exciting. Um, I am going to show an, another video about what the, um, the Innovation Campus means to some of our partners and we co came without there with. And then uh, I'll have a chance to bring up John Raymond and what it means particularly to the Medical College of Wisconsin of us being at a location out here. I think Milwaukee is a great city. The quality of life here is just amazing. I really like the city. There's an incredible amount of potential and talent here. I, I think if someone wants to make, make a difference in Milwaukee and have the maximum impact, I think this project is the one project in the region that they invest in, they're going to see it benefit the most people. UWM is becoming recognized as one of the finest urban universities in the United States. I think there have been great advances, really strong leadership, and great concepts like Innovation Campus. Innovation Campus is our future. It will serve as a focal point for collaborations, for new scientific generation of ideas, and also economic innovation and development. It will bring together, in a critical mass, 
a lot of the a lot of the skills, a lot of the educational capability, and a lot of the innovation. There's so much opportunity for this campus to bring together all the players on the Milwaukee Regional Medical Center campus. If you combine the bioengineering researchers on our campus with those out at the Regional Medical Center and you combine those together, we'd be the seventh largest researcher bioengineering program in the country. Biomedical sciences has really enhanced many, many, many of the ways that we are able to help people. While it may be subtle, one of the most important aspects of this development is the ability to recruit the intellectual capital into southeastern Wisconsin. When a student works with professionals, they get real-world experience. And some of that stuff you can't learn in the classroom. And, you know, some of that stuff you can't even learn in a regular research lab. Because these companies bring about real-world problems, you know, things that we just don't have to deal with in an academic environment. And that is invaluable. UWM is a tremendous asset to the community. To bring these together from a strengths-based perspective it is really very smart because we're doing great things for people, but we could do better. It's just a great concept that I wish we'd have thought of 10 years ago. This project is going to produce thousands of jobs. When I look around the region, I don't see any other projects that are going to have the opportunity to make such a big impact. We can build and we must build on that reputation so that Milwaukee becomes a center of national excellence. I've made my fortune right here in Milwaukee. Do I owe anything back to Milwaukee? You bet I do. I think I do. There are lots of certain basics here. And I think one of the basics is that you give back and try and help others and use your knowledge to, to do that. You're going to bring jobs. You're going to bring, you know, cool technology. You're going to bring everything that these young people want, you know, people like myself, researchers. And so with that being said, I can see it as a place where I can actually make this my home. I think it's going to be the transformational change, you know, within the city that we really need. We need this because Milwaukee deserves to be a national leader. This is clearly an investment in our future. Innovation Campus is opportunity. There's never been a better time. It's excitement. Dream about what it could be. It's transformation. It's the right thing to do. It just makes sense. It's Milwaukee. Make an investment in an admission campus today. I believe you'll be building the future of Milwaukee for tomorrow. So I'd like to bring up one of the, uh, the stars of the video you just saw, uh, John Raymond. Thanks, Mike. I want to say it's an honor to be here uh, speaking to the regions today on behalf of the spirit of partnership and collaboration that is reverberating throughout the entire UW system, and especially here at UW-Milwaukee. I'm the president of the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I'd like to just take a few minutes for those of you not familiar with us to tell you a little bit about our institution and why it's so important to us to be partnering with the UW system and with UWM. We were founded in 1893 as a private freestanding medical school and have grown into one of the largest private medical schools in the country, matriculating over 200 students each year. We have a significant economic impact in the region with revenues of about $1 billion per year, $100 million of which comes through federal funding, primarily through the National Institutes of Health and competitive research grant programs. We have over $200 million a year of research expenditures, which ranks us as the second largest research institution in the state of Wisconsin. We also have the largest physician practice in the state of Wisconsin and the largest accumulation of peer-designated best doctors in the state of Wisconsin, with 45% of those physicians being on our faculty. We're also the academic anchor of the Milwaukee Regional Medical Center campus, which you heard Mike speak about briefly here earlier, which has accumulated revenues of approximately $4 billion per year. Uh, we are the academic anchor and provide the faculty for the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, the fourth ranked children's hospital according to Parents Magazine, Freighter Hospital, a top 100 hospital in the country, and one of only 15 academic medical centers so designated by Truven and the Blood Research Institute, which is a component of the Blood Center of Wisconsin, which is the largest freestanding blood-oriented research institute in the country. I want to just talk a little bit about um, our collaborations with the system. 
We're expanding our medical schools so that we can serve the entire state of Wisconsin. And one of the linchpins of our strategy is partnership with UW system uh, and with individual universities throughout the system. These include UW Green Bay, UW Stevens Point, UW Marathon County, and UW Marshfield Wood County, with new collaborations in health sciences developing at UW Eau Claire. I want to compliment the exceptional academic and administrative leadership of the system. Uh, many of our academic partners are seated here in the room today. Uh, I consider them friends and colleagues. And also uh, want to congratulate and thank Kevin Riley for his leadership in helping us to form these bridges between the state system and our private medical school. I um, also want to say that um, we want to take our excellence in clinical care and our strength in quantitative or in life sciences and bring a partner, a great comprehensive university, to our campus so that our faculty have direct and immediate access to experts in quantitative sciences, engineering, humanities, public health, applied research, business and entrepreneurship. And I think you know that UWM can bring all of those to the table and can help us to leverage that $4 billion of revenue on the MRMC into something great for the state of Wisconsin. It's been an honor and a pleasure for me to work with Mike Lovell and to get to know him. He's a true force here in the state. Um, I do want to say we already have some existing collaborations with UWM. Uh, these include bioengineering, public health, technology transfer, and most recently a hopefully soon to be successful co-recruitment of a distinguished faculty member who is a cancer epidemiologist. So I just want to close by saying that UWM is a key for the innovation uh, campus and this will allow us on the MRMC to convert ideas and molecules into therapies, products, companies, and jobs that benefit the UW system and the entire state of Wisconsin. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, John. And um, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, particularly John, has just been a great partner and a great leader, and it's always been a pleasure to work with him. And he really, the medical colleges, as he mentioned, we're currently uh, co-recruiting someone. They've really gone above and beyond the call of duty to help bring some talent uh, to um, Wisconsin that I don't believe we've gotten otherwise if we had been working together. Uh, finally, I just want to kind of close in saying, you know, uh, there was a master plan that was uh, put together for Innovation Campus. This is just a diagram of 89 acres that we have. And if you take a look at the diagram going north to south, the southern portion of the, of the, of the uh, parcel was more for the academic side of the building. Going north in the middle was more for the corporate partnership uh, buildings, and going to the very end was uh, uh, some housing and some other things, with the idea that it would be live, learn, work, play. It was kind of the, the model here. And I just want to kind of show you in the last year how this project has really accelerated. Uh, yeah, for those of you here yesterday, we had Todd Brown from ABB talking about why ABB is locating there. They're uh, bringing, uh, they're going to have a 95,000 square foot building. They're moving their headquarters, uh, uh, the regional headquarters here, uh, to the county grounds, and they're going to be adding 350 employees uh, to the site. So they are the first corporate tenant. And for those of you who don't know ABB, they are a world leader in terms of power and automation, uh, and probably about uh, they're international and about 10 times bigger than Rockwell. So it's a really great partner for us. We already have about 12 faculty that are working with ABB. On some research projects. Uh, in addition, one of the things we're very excited about is there's actually a charter school that is trying to develop on some old Eshwala buildings in the northern part of campus. Uh, they're going to have a STEM-centered uh, forest exploration center, which really fits in line uh, with what we're trying to do and, and make this an innovative campus. So we may actually have a charter school located on the northern side of campus fairly soon. Uh, also, uh, we've just recently announced in the last few weeks that uh, there's a, a private entity that's going to be building an extended state hotel on our campus for many reasons, uh, for the researchers that come here, for a lot of time, people that are working both in Meco College and UWM, and uh, we're excited to have that going on as well. So when we take a look at where we are today, you know, where we had the master plan over the last year, what all has happened, well, we talk about what's happened, the accelerator building as well on its way to being built. We have an extended state hotel. Um, ABB has uh, chosen to be located on the site. Uh, Barry Mandel is going to be building housing uh, at, at the northern portion. We still have a habitat zone, we'll still have trail system. So it's really exciting to see actually the building out of Innovation Campus just as it has been envisioned. So as you can tell, uh, our campus is really changing and transforming. I talked about it before, we're changing faster than before. We're very excited 
uh, about what's happening on campus. It's a very exciting time to be here. And I really appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to tell a little bit of our story. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for a great presentation. Uh, President Riley wanted to say something. Yeah. Uh, you know, a number of years ago when we put our uh, growth agenda for Wisconsin together, the strategic framework for how the system could step up and help Wisconsin to get to uh, where it needs to go, we said it was about three things. One, how do we use the resources of the system to uh, create more graduates? How do we use the resources to grow more jobs? How do we use the resources of the system to help develop thriving, successful communities all around the state? And in Doing that, we kept comparing ourselves to Minnesota, which we always do. And Minnesota, on the more graduates we know pulled out ahead of us, they now have more uh, uh, people with baccalaureate degrees than the national average. We're still below that. Uh, and we uh, kept asking ourselves, what are the, the barriers to getting there on the more graduates, the more jobs, the more thriving communities? And uh, when you look at what happened in Minnesota, it's clear that the Twin Cities Metroplex is a magnet for talent from all over the upper Midwest, the country internationally, has had a lot to do with why they have more college educated people in their population. And we often said if Milwaukee could be that kind of magnet for this state, the kind of talent magnet that the Twin Cities has become for Minnesota, we would jump ahead by leaps and bounds. And I, I just want to say, Chancellor Lovell and, uh, and your partners, including uh, your medical college partner who's still here and all the others, I really think now that Milwaukee is about to become that talent magnet. And it will change not only the metropolitan area of Milwaukee, it will change the whole state of Wisconsin for the better. So congratulations to you and all your partners for what you're doing, Mike. Anything else for a chance? Thank you again, Mike, for a great presentation. Um, now we'll turn our attention, perhaps a little different mood, to a discussion of our 13-15 biennial budget. Um, You'll recall that at our last meeting in April uh, came shortly after the governor had released his executive budget. Uh, to put it mildly, much has uh, changed since then, and this is our first opportunity to discuss those, you know, those changes as a group. Um, we're, we're, how we're going to proceed today is uh, President Riley will make some remarks, David Miller will make a presentation, and then we'll have a chance to discuss, although I, two things, if during David's pr presentation, Oh, Mike's not done. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were done. The, uh, one of the things that the, the, uh, the uh, campuses are asked to do uh, is make a brief uh, presentation about the strategic priorities. And that's so the second part. So sorry to, to, to interrupt you there. Um, so the... Uh, and we'll move to this fairly quickly. Uh, but I, I do want to give some background about some other things that are going on on the campus. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do, obviously, is establish strategic priorities for the campus. You've seen many of the things we've done in partnerships. But in doing so as a campus, we did uh, several things. Uh, first, we started with looking at our mission. Uh, we defined a vision for a future, and we established uh, values and transparent decision-making to find really how we treat each other. And so uh, our, our mission, obviously, was defined uh, for us by the Board of Regents in the state of Wisconsin. And we were the only institution uh, in the system that has uh, the dual mission of, of both being an access institution for high quality instruction and premier you know, research university. So we, we have this dual mission. And so we embrace that mission. Uh, but one of the things that we did last year, uh, back in 2012, is we decided that we wanted to uh, define our vision, defining who we wanted to be. And so we came up with a vision statement that uh, I won't read it to you. I think it's in the packets that many of you have. But we really talk about being a top tier research university is the best place to learn and work. And so that became a real emphasis for us, you know, defining, you know, who we wanted to be going forward and talk a little bit about how we do it. Uh, the great thing about this vision statement was approved by all governance groups uh, last year because uh, we all agreed on, on where we wanted to go. Uh, the next thing we did uh, the next year, is, is a lot of the process, was actually uh, defining our guiding values. Now, as many of you know, um, we, important when you're making strategic decisions is you need to define what your values are. So you need to align uh, when you have to make tough decisions about how you use your resources, how they align with your values. So, again, we came up with a set of guiding values. Um, 
I won't read these, but um, again, many of the, the, the regions have this in their packet, but really focusing on what makes us unique, what we believe in, and how we would make decisions uh, going forward. And between our values statements that we came up with, and, and I, again, I'm not going to go through these in, specifically, um, the idea was is that when we came up to make some, some hard decisions, we had a set of values to turn to uh, to make those decisions how we would use our, our, our valuable resources. The other thing we decided is when you have to make those hard decisions, they're difficult, and they're difficult on the people that have to make them. So one of the things that we did as part of our Best Place to Work initiative is we defined a campus code of conduct, the way that we would treat each other and the way we would be collegial uh, with each other so everyone on campus would be held accountable for their actions. And so we did this uh, knowing that as we have limited resources, we have to make hard decisions, particularly as we're trying to align things, uh, we were able to do that. So <clears throat> once we defined our values and, our, and established our vision, uh, we've now embarked on a really significant initiative on our campus. It's really a three-stage approach. We're doing academic planning, which are developing clear, effective research for student success and really doing new academic plans that are aligned with the future jobs and the needs of the states. We're doing strategic planning on determining how to allocate our resources and we're creating a new budget model. And for those of you who are on college campuses, doing all three of these things at one time is, is, is really a challenge. But it's critically important now, when you look at where higher ed is heading, the changes that we're going through, that we believe that we, if we don't do this, we're not going to be well positioned for the future. Our academic planning, we launched last August. And again, the real key here, the most important thing we're trying to do is ensure that our graduates uh, have the skills that will ensure their future success, both in terms of technical and critical thinking. And the other thing we're trying to do is align our academic programs in, in the course we're teaching with the growth areas that have identified by the state, things like water, energy, bioengineering, food and beverage, innovation on entrepreneurship and healthcare. And so what we've done is we've taken a full look at our program array and how we can repackage some of the things we're doing, oftentimes across discipline boundaries, uh, to fit these. Uh, to fit these. Uh, by going through this process, we're also creating more efficiency. We're finding redundancies in our, in our, our campus that allow us to be more effective in the way we deliver courses. Um, it also allows us to look at, okay, where are some of the high-impact programs that we should be moving into to make sure we ensure future? And finally, we can talk about how we can incorporate uh, technology into new educational paradigm on our campus. Um, we also, uh, back in uh, November of last year, we launched our strategic planning process. So academic planning is coming first. That will drive the strategic planning. And again, ensure during these challenging times you know, that we can align our resources and programs that help us grow and achieve our mission and vision. Uh, the plan, obviously, is going to be a roadmap uh, for our future and how we are going to allocate our resources. And uh, really the idea is, is that we need to make sure that we are investing, that we'll create new opportunities for our faculty and students and bring new resources and funding streams to our campus. Uh, we're very fortunate to this, have this led by uh, Mark Moni, who's a Sheldon uh, Lubor School of Business professor who does this for businesses and organizations across the country. Uh, talk about how what a burden this is and challenges this for campus. We have over 220 faculty, staff, and students involved on 18 different teams that are driving this forward. Uh, this is going to be about a 19-month process, uh, so we'll be done about a year from now in May or June for strategic planning. Uh, but again, I think maybe the most challenging po portion of these three things is the new budget model. Uh, for those of you, you know, we start talking about changing budgets, it makes a lot of people nervous on the campus. And so uh, our current budget model is about a decade old, so more decade old. And it was really derived in a time we were try trying to drive enrollment growth on our campus. Now, we know that our budget model needs modification because our enrollment has stabilized and we have many building projects that are underway or nearing completion. And so we are conducting the new budget model in parallel with the academic and strategic planning so that when the strategic planning is completed, we will have a model that has resources that will value, be able to help us invest in things that will help us grow. Because right now our budget model, most of the money sits out in the units, in the schools and colleges. Again, that was set up to help them drive enrollments. We need more money centrally to be able to strategically invest in helping move the campus forward. Uh, this process is being left by a national expert, uh, Larry Holstein, consultant we've hired, who's, who's an, an, a renowned author of uh, the book called College and University Budgeting. So he's really an expert. He's helped us. We have more than 40 uh, members from across campus that are part of a uh, budget model working group uh, that is really the budget model will then follow directly after strategic planning and academic planning on our campus. Uh, with all of these uh, different models uh, going on at one time, all this work, there's been a lot of confusion on campus about what the academic plan is doing, what the 
what the street of pain is doing, what the budget model we're groups doing. We've actually, I, it's hard to see, but we've actually developed a web portal. Many of these things are going to be discussed uh, by our uh, provost during his, uh, during the educational uh, presentation later today when the education committee meets. So um, this, um, this web portal, you can click on any portion to find out where any one of these groups are in the process, just so that everyone can be engaged in the process going forward. Uh, furthermore, uh, one of the other things we've done, I've, I've done, is when we talk about changing a culture and, and trying to adapt uh, strategically, I took a trip to uh, Cisco uh, last November and I spent two days with Cisco and, and John Morgridge to talk about ways that they change their culture. And uh, one of the things that they've done is talked about how you make transparent decision-making processes where you align uh, what you're doing with, with what your, your vision and your goals are uh, and help prioritize decision making. And they have a diagram called VSEM, which again, I'm, I'm expecting you to show, but this is a Cisco uh, generated model where uh, talk about how, what initiative, how it aligns with your vision, um, which is how it also, why is it a strategic priority? And I think more important, uh, this shows uh, how execution, the ESAMS for execution, how are you going to execute this? And, and what, what's the metric? So who's responsible and how you're going to measure that responsibility? So it really holds accountability for any initiative they have ongoing. And when I brought this back, form back to campus, uh, they said it was built for an engineer and it was a little bit too complicated. So uh, we came up with something that was a little bit easier for people to understand and be able to engage in. And so uh, this decision-making form includes describe the initiative and the details that is being proposed, uh, the vision and values, how does this initiative fit with our vision and values which we've come up with on campus, the execution, how will the program be planned, managed, and implemented, and who is the program and who's going to be responsible for the execution and the results. You know, how are you going to measure uh, results? You know, how are we going to evaluate whether this initiative is worth investment from the campus and how are we going to see it, the progress is like going forward. Uh, and again, this is something that's new. Uh, and again, we, um, even though we're doing strategic planning, we need to make decisions now. So I've asked, actually asked my staff and, and other leadership on campus to begin using this as we need to make decisions on campus. And we did have a brief presentation from, from two of my vice chancellors, um, Joan Prince, the vice chancellor for global inclusion and engagement, and uh, Mike Libby, the vice chancellor of student affairs, to talk about how they're utilizing it within their units uh, to uh, make strategic decisions. Thank you, Chancellor. Good morning, everyone. As Chancellor Lovell said, a couple of months ago as we prepared for the 2013-14 administrative and fiscal year, he asked his executive staff to identify our top three to four priorities and to utilize a common decision-making template on a copy of that uh, you have in front of you. And what I'd like to do today is actually uh, provide an example of how we utilize that template in my division, Global Inclusion and Engagement, to not only identify our top three to four priorities, but to look for alignment with my other colleagues and looking at their templates uh, and reviewing some of their templates, which we will be doing at the Chancellor's Retreat in a couple of weeks, to make sure that we as a group uh, as, of colleagues are aligned with our campus strategic planning process and priorities. So the one in front of you that I briefly wanted to walk you through utilizing the template is what we're calling the Mosaic Faculty Recruitment and Retention Program. And part of our benchmarking research, both internal and external to higher education, obviously our internal research uh, information uh, being driven by the American Council on Education, AAC and UNAGB, as, our, as examples, but also our external corporate partners such as GE, Intel, Nike, Baird, and Deloitte, where they clearly uh, provide reports to us that delineate the benefits of organizational inclusion, and they con connect and align that inclusion with a direct return on investment, uh, with expanding the characteristics of the talent pool when you're looking at recruiting and retaining talent in an organization. So what we decided as a priority, along with our provost and our chancellor, is to look at the mosaic recruitment and retention model of faculty engagement, which really focuses on a model for all faculty hiring and retention, and we are starting particularly with those that have identified with faculty of color. And you see that outlined on the first page in the initiative section. As we move to the second part of the template, looking at the vision and values, and what the questions are that were asked of us that we 
responded to to help focus us is does the program actually fit within the overall university vision? And if so, what guiding values did we utilize in coming to this decision? And what you have outlined in front of you is the fact that yes, it directly aligns with the UWM vision and values. And I outlined for you the particular part of both the visions and pulled out, vision, excuse me, and pulled out two uh, pieces of the values. Uh, the one in particular where it says, we value diversity in all of its definitions, including who we are, how we think, and what we do. And finally, one of the values that clearly aligns with this program initiative is that we value pride in our institution, our unique qualities, and our vital role. The third piece of the template really focuses on the execution. Obviously, if these are our, are our prior, priorities, we need to be able to state and to focus who's driving the initiative, uh, what's the planning, how will it be managed, how will it be implemented, who's the program leader. And for this particular initiative, as you can see in front of you, uh, the chancellor has asked me to lead this as the vice chancellor for global inclusion and engagement. And of course, it is about faculty recruitment and faculty retention, and that cannot be done without the auspices and the the uh, interactions and relationships with our provost, Johannes Britz, and our faculty governance, as well as our academic leadership, the deans of our schools and colleges. So while this program, the initial model, focuses on re uh, recruiting and retaining faculty of color, it will emerge as the recruitment model for all faculty. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of the strategies that I have listed, that I have listed under the execution piece. I'll let you read through that but want to move you sort of to the final piece, which was guiding our thinking, and that's the results section. Um, I tease my chancellor by saying I'm dealing now with a, a rehabbing engineer. Uh, I think he's an engineer in rehab, but uh, uh, what that means is that the majority of our discussions are guided by uh, data-driven uh, decision-making. Uh, what's the results? What's your baseline? What does success look like, either short-term or long-term? And so that's what's outlined in the final piece of the decision-making template. For this particular program, our baseline is will be determined and adjusted on an annual basis as national data is available regarding the job pools. Uh, but our short-term and long-term success is identified for both pieces of this initiative. So from the faculty of color recruitment standpoint, as you can see under number one, that will be based on hiring proportion to their availability in the job pools, and I do have numeric numbers for you to review for, for both short-term and long-term success on both the hiring and the retention piece. So that is just a brief example of how we take each of our priorities as part of the executive team. We utilize a common decision-making template, and then we move those forward having discussions with the rest of the executive team to see where our alignment is for our overall campus strategic planning priorities. Having said that, I will now turn the, the uh, podium over to my colleague, Vice Chancellor Michael LaLiberty, and he's our Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, and he will provide an additional example for you. Thank you, Dr. Prince, and good morning, and welcome to UWM. Um, rather than get into the details of this forum, I'd like to really talk a little bit about why this forum is so important to us as leaders. It really is a way that we are holding each other accountable, that we are looking at, at programs that are important to the campus, and that even as, as individual leaders we may think are important to the campus, but we have to vet that through our other colleagues and say that, our programs are going to have, what impact is this program going to have, what impact is this initiative going to have on the overall campus. Our, uh, our top initiative in student affairs at this point is our strategic enrollment management plan and really looking at how we're going to um, be competitive in a marketplace that we're losing um, the number of high school graduates in Wisconsin and being able to expand uh, beyond the area of Wisconsin and draw students to Milwaukee. We have a great product. We've got to get that product uh, into the hands of other folks and bring them to our campus. 
So we're focusing on four areas. One is called the Milwaukee Advantage. It's a grant program that we'll be offering to students in the Mid-State um, Exchange Program um, who can come to a Wisconsin institution for one and a half times the in-state tuition. Uh, we're doing a comprehensive recruitment training program to make sure that our, train, our recruiters are using the most innovative and creative social media um, and technologies available to them. Our campus visit program has been completely rehabbed and will be um, unveiled over the next uh, couple of months to uh, speak to people's experience on the campus because we're finding that if a student visits our campus, 75% uh, of those visits result in an application uh, as, and as, as well as leading to uh, folks enrolling. Um, and then we're also expanding our territories. We're finding through research that students outside of our immediate research area, uh, one of our top um, areas where people are inquiring about UWM is California and we have done very little recruiting if, over the past five years in California at all, so we need to get into that marketplace because folks are interested in coming to Milwaukee. As we start looking at the execution, uh, the vision and how this fits into who we are is maintaining uh, our top tier research university status, looking at student access and opportunity, uh, but also being innovative in the way that we're reaching out and reaching across to um, really establish ourselves as, an, as a national um, contender for uh, students in the, in the research area. The Milwaukee Advantage will be a $1,000 grant that is granted to folks who are accepted to the MSEP program beginning in fall of 14. Um, that will be available to them for five years, uh, which would just give us that one step up um, as we compete for those students. Um, our recruiting training will be looking at two weeks of intensive training for our recruiters to, for them to understand who our students are, what the market is, what we're trying to reach, uh, what, how we're going to really expand on programs that are um, coming out of our, our colleges that are innovative and creative and what are those talking points that we're going to be providing to students and families. Our results that we're hoping to, um, and we're holding ourselves accountable to, is the Milwaukee Advantage program will increase our out-of-state enrollment between 2 and 5% by 2014. Our recruitment training program will be using a customer relations management system to guarantee that our students are, and, and inquiries are answered in a timely manner. Um, our our uh, campus visit program, we're looking to um, have a minimum 65% yield rate on those folks who come to campus uh, for high school seniors who are visiting with us. And then our additional territories, um, within three years, we'll be looking at 5% coming out of areas that we, have, we are presently not recruiting in, which would include California, Arizona, Florida, Texas. Those have been identified as areas where we've been getting quite a bit of uh, activity of people inquiring. So this tool has been really important for us as leaders because not only are we having to say this is what we plan on doing, but what will the results be? And holding ourselves accountable, um, holding the institution accountable, um, and, and letting folks know that we are um, being transparent in what we're doing and what we hope to achieve. And if this isn't working, we need to be able to um, pull back. And if it is working, how we can expand it even further. So I, I really appreciate uh, the Chinch's initiative of, of putting this out as a tool for us to be able to use to better our, uh, our relationships and better our working um, uh, initiatives moving forward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. And uh, just to kind of wrap things up, I, I know we, uh, we're running out of time. The, uh, it would be premature to have too many strategic initiatives until the strategic plan is done, but there are three things I just want to point out that we're really focusing on as a campus in the meantime until the strategic plan is done. And one is enrollments. Uh, we need to stabilize our freshman class. We have a goal to do it at 4,000. We want to increase our international students from 1,250 to 3,000 in the next four to five years and increase our out-of-state, as Michael mentioned, some of his efforts to go from 18 to 15 percent over the next four to five years. Uh, second thing is uh, in those priorities, retention. Uh, we want to get our six-year um, uh, graduation rate to 50 percent. It's currently at 42. Uh, we want to increase our first-year retention rate uh, from 70 to 75 percent over the next four to five years, and we want to have equivalent uh, retention and graduation rates for all different populations of our students, no matter what background they come from. 
And finally, uh, the last treatment program I want to mention is research. Uh, we want to increase our research by 66 percent over the next uh, five to seven years, and particularly focusing on federal research, uh, federal funding from 30 to 50 million over the next five years. So I, again, I, I'm done now, Brett. Yeah, so, so I appreciate I appreciate everyone's attention and uh, the opportunity for us to talk about our strategic initiatives on campus. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great job, Mike. Well, now we'll uh, we'll try again. To, to change always is good with our budget discussions, I guess. So uh, uh, we'll go back to uh, our thirteen fifteen budget, and uh, I was just saying that I think we're going to President Riley is going to have a few comments, and we're going to have uh, David Miller make a presentation. And I think during David's presentation, we should feel free to, if you don't want to wait till the end to, to make comments or ask questions, uh, certainly the chancellors are welcome too, to, to uh, uh, join in. So with that, I'll have us start off with uh, President Riley. Very good. Well, uh, as President Smith noted, uh, the landscape has shifted a few times since we last uh, met. Governor Walker released his original biennial budget in February. He then amended that proposed budget following a great deal of public discourse about the program revenue balances held by UW institutions and the system. Uh, the subject of program revenue balances will be discussed in much greater depth this afternoon at the Business Finance and Audit Committee. But let me just reiterate here one point. Uh, information about those balances was contained in UW Systems financial records, which have been and will always be public. These reports are audited by the Legislative Audit Bureau, discussed at public meetings, and shared widely. Nonetheless, we are committed to being even more transparent in the ways we report financial information and how we use that data in setting budgets and tuition rates. That will be the focus of this afternoon's discussion in the Business Finance and Audit Committee, where Regent Whitburn and uh, his committee members will begin work on new policies that achieve several goals. The first of these goals should be to ensure the financial health and stability of each UW institution and the UW system as a whole. We must develop new mechanisms for prudent fiscal management and accountability while providing flexibility needed by each UW institution to fulfill its mission. Today's committee discussion and any full board conversation that follows tomorrow are the first steps we will take in demonstrating our commitment to transparency and to nurturing public trust. This morning, we'll focus on the upcoming biennial budget, which will make its way through the Assembly and the Senate very soon. Governor Walker's amended budget, released on May 15th, called for a two-year tuition freeze reduced state support for the UW, and called on UW to self-fund several new initiatives and other expenses. The Joint Finance Committee then amended the budget again. Incoming Senior Vice President David Miller is here to walk us through this evolution and how the changes will impact our UW institutions. So over to David. Thank you, President Riley. My intent is just to give you a very matter-of-fact um, summary of the budget to make some sense of what can be some very confusing numbers because uh, the budget goes through so many iterations um, and then take your questions. Just to review what was in the governor's recommendation, you're familiar with the $181 million increase. It's important to emphasize this is a biennial increase, meaning if you remember with biennial math, if you have dollars in the first year and second year, the first year, whether it's an up or down, counts again in the second year, and then you count the second year's numbers on top of that, so it isn't um, 181 all at once. That's on top of a base of a GPR fee pool of dollars used for academic instruction and mission of about $2.3 billion over the two years, just about 1.1 uh, and a half each year. So, and the governor's budget contained no uh, base cuts, which was very good news, as you know, and um, funded our, the majority of our costs to continue items and placed compensation 
uh, base compensation that had normally been in the compensation reserve uh, for all state employees in the university's base budget. So the finance version uh, that just wrapped up Tuesday night uh, ends up with a $2.5 million GPR, this is just the taxpayer portion, general purpose revenue reduction over our FY12-13 base level. So we're going to look at why is the number much, much, much more serious than $2.5 million uh, over the biennium. Um, first of all, how we get there is the compensation dollars were moved out of the university's budget back to the compensation reserve. The good news is there, the dollars were retained and are still, will still be applied to university employees for compensation. We'll just be paid out of the compensation reserve instead of our base budget. There's no funding for new initiatives. Um, however, we still have to fund those. There is funding for debt service and costs continue. However, that's offset by a base reduction of $65.7 million, um, which is how you get to a biennial reduction of $2.5 million. So the taxpayer support for the university system over the biennium decreased in the joint finance version by $183.8 million. Different way to look at it is what are our unfunded obligations um, both by, for the biennium both in GPR and, and program revenue? In the governor's budget, uh, even with all of the funding, the $181 million of new taxpayer support, we would have had an unfunded liability of $47 million, which would have come from tuition and or reallocation. Um, you might recall a 2% tuition increase over the biennium would have generated about $42 million to give you a gauge of what we were looking at to meet the governor's budget in the first year. So what does that look like now? Our unfunded liabilities have gone up to $202.6 million. So that's why say, looking at it only as what is our GPR reduction, $2.5 million, can be quite misleading because that does not include what bills, new bills, do we have to pay regardless. Adds up to $202 million of cuts and lapses. And in a moment I'll talk about what's one time and what's ongoing. That is made up of the, you see the list there, uh, the tuition, traditional tuition share of compensation, so under the tuition freeze we won't have new tuition to pay that cost. Um, cost to continue has a tuition share, the tuition freeze we generate no new tuition to pay that cost. New initiatives were still required to do even though the funding was deleted and the uh, one-time money of the Wisconsin Higher Education grant uh, of $58.3 million in the first year of the biennium, the general fund revenue that funds that program is replaced with university program revenue. And then, of course, the base cut of $65.8 million. So the change in our unfunded liabilities went up $155.6 million with no new revenue to cover those liabilities. The tuition freeze, we've, um, I just mentioned, uh, there is an exception uh, that allows for differentials that have phased in uh, rates to continue if they were approved prior to June 1, 2011. Um, an additional uh, freeze is placed on the allocable portion of segregated free, uh, fees. They're also frozen at the uh, 11, excuse me, 12, 13 level as well. That will create um, some management difficulty for the institutions because those budgets were adopted by students who were gone for the summer. They'll have to come back in the fall, look at uh, what the revenue base is and readjust 
they may have used that for new programs or have cut some programs, so it will be a complicated thing to administer, I think, institutions. But I think maybe the best way to look at the budget is I like to think of, of expenses and operating revenue. What, what do we owe versus what do we have? And this is a very simplified chart of just the rolled up numbers to, to compare those. So in the 13-14 year, we have new expenses that we have to pay out of $59.7 million. And we lose $5.9 million of base funding. And we have one-time reductions that are just in that first year of 62.1 million dollars. That WEG transfer is the biggest of that. So our new expenses and lost revenue mean we owe 127 million more than we have revenue expectations to bring in. So that, that's the reallocation. And then in the second year, and, and ongoing annually thereafter, um, we have expenses of $78 million, uh, a minor funding increase because that WEG funding comes back in the second year um, of $3.4 million, leaving us a shortfall of uh, just about $75 million ongoing. However, um, some of those biennial costs are, are only for the biennium. So they're not one year, but they're for the biennium, leaving an ongoing obligation of $62 million. This just restates what I've um, already said about the higher education grant and that the funding comes back in the second year, so it's not an ongoing liability. It will be covered out of um, one-time funds. This is just a summary of the economic development initiatives uh, that we now have to cover uh, out of uh, reserves or base reductions. The personnel system and compensation authority, um, there were two flexibilities going forward. One that had been before the board many times uh, for review was creating university personnel system for all institutions other than Madison and Madison's university per, uh, personnel system for, for Madison. And, uh, the board had fully approved the implementation of those. They were pending the Joint Committee on Employment Relations approval uh, and now have been um, postponed until July 1 of 15. So they weren't deleted. It was postponed for two years. The same with the governor's recommendation to let the Board of Regents be the final authority on setting compensation for all employees, postponed until July 1 of 15. So the resolution that you have received that will be considered in the Business and Finance uh, and Audit Committee today uh, addresses this issue and uh, states that the board directs the UW system president to request uh, authority to come back to the Joint Committee on Employment Relations through um, the former process to seek supplemental funding, excuse me, seek supplemental authority to use institutional funding for pay plan uh, later in the biennium. With the, um, we also have reporting requirements. Uh, there are a lot of new reporting requirements in the budget um, across the board, um, particularly for program revenue end of year balances. Um, we must develop a methodology uh, that's due by September 1st. That's a fairly straightforward exercise. But the meat of this requirement is in the second bullet, and that is uh, developing uh, proposed appropriation balance limits by system and the institution and policies um, for those limits and submitting those by the end of the year to the Joint Committee on Finance um, for approval under their uh, review process. There are two other uh, reporting requirements in there as well that, that aren't about the balances but about different issues. 
This is about how the GPR fee pool of dollars is allocated to the institutions. We are to report policies regarding the annual distribution of tuition revenues and state GPR uh, to finance and also report on uh, policies regarding the expenditure of GPR funds and tuition revenue. And what that latter one is getting at is um, the statutes don't require, don't allow us to carry forward GPR at the end of the year. So the balance carried forward from the GPR fee pool is fee, is tuition. And they want to see a policy about how those dollars are spent throughout the year. The core credit transfer you are familiar with from the previous uh, budget consideration. The only change there is in the second bullet. Um, it deleted, the, the Finance Committee deleted language about without loss of credit toward graduation or a specific course of study and replaced it with satisfy general education requirements at the receiving institutions to make the transfer broader. Um, another um, significant change regards the mandatory, mandatory refundable fee that is a process currently utilized by United Council. The language says that the board may provide uh, a way for students to pay an additional fee, but may not require students to pay a fee whether or not it's refundable. We have a new annual report on fees, um, considering two things, that we are to report by October uh, each year. So this is, a, is an annual and ongoing report, not a one-time report like the uh, previous ones. A list of all fees charged to students at each institution. And that's what the language says. We'll see what the, if the statutory language clarifies that at all. But the way it was stated in the motion, it's all fees you know, of, of any kind. Um, and the amount uh, by which they've increased over a five-year period. So that would just be a rolling change every, um, every year updated. So in conclusion, why are these numbers fairly confusing? They're, they're big numbers and there's big swings in the numbers and it can be easy to use one or the other. Um, the increase in the governor's budget was 181 million. There is only an actual two and a half million dollars in real dollar terms loss of GPR over the biennium. Very misleading because the real cost to the university is the unfunded uh, liabilities we now have that total $202 million and then annually and ongoing we have to reallocate to cover $62 million. I do have to say a word about the capital budget, um, wearing both hats today. Um, the total capital budget uh, borrowing is in, in bonding, our, uh, the first column, bottom row, uh, just over 500 million in general fund borrowing and 652 million dollars in mainly program revenue, other borrowing. So from those two numbers, the Finance Committee is requiring the Building Commission to uh, reduce that by 250 million dollars. And it's an interesting way they, they did it. They, they authorized the borrowing and then said the Building Commission may not uh, implement $250 million of those totals. Uh, so there will, a lot of work lies ahead in our working with the Building Commission um, to figure out where that's going to come from. You can see in the top line the university's share of um, that amount of money. Uh, certainly we're not all of it, but we are the majority of it. And in your packets, uh, certainly not for right now, but I placed a um, detail table, so if those of you who are more interested in specific numbers and specific programs, you can um, refer to that rather than just the roll-up table. That's sort of the matter of fact. If I could, in summary, just put this in a bit broader characterization. Um, we have a, a $2.3 billion GPR fee base over the biennium combined. 
However, there's very, very, very little margin in that, meaning it's committed funds. And, and often we hear from legislators and even the public and people I meet at the grocery store, you, you have all that money, you could figure out a way to do everything. Well, you can really only figure out a way to do everything by cutting something because it, it is not idle funds. And even the program revenue balances, uh, when you drill down to the detail, uh, those balances were accrued against primarily known liabilities and looking historically as a hedge against cuts and lapses. So we have a situation in which we had a very favorable budget, but uh, of that 181 million increase, remember 152 of it was just new GPR to cover fixed cost increases that are largely passed on to us by the state. So the bottom line is we can manage this. We can, and, and we will. It, it will not be easy because all those dollars have to be managed by decisions of not doing something that was either planned or committed. But those decisions will be made, and we will move forward uh, and adjust, and we'll do better in the future years, beginning this year, in transparency and reporting, and, uh, and be sure that we have very open processes that everyone understands uh, the funds we have available and how they're planned to be used. Thank you for your time. President Riley, do you want to take a first? I, 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 yes, and thank, I want to thank David for that excellent, concise overview of a really complex and I have to say disappointing budget. Uh, I, I want to pick up on two uh, issues uh, that he raised. Uh, as you heard, uh, the uh, Legislature's Joint Finance Committee removed a provision that would have let uh, this board take full responsibility for faculty and staff compensation. Uh, legislators also delayed the implementation of the new UW personnel policies that have been worked on for two years, new ways of logically aligning our work titles and job descriptions in a university setting in ways that put us on a more level playing field with our higher education peers. Together with the financial challenges that uh, David just uh, outlined, this leaves us with a growing threat uh, to the health and the vitality of our UW institutions, most especially the fact that faculty salaries remain at least 18 percent lower than those at peer universities. This gap uh, should concern anyone who wants our public university to strengthen Wisconsin's workforce and boost its economy. The quality of a UW diploma is the product of quality people who teach and support UW students. And that quality is being undermined because we are not closing that compensation gap. While the budget in its current form does not give this board sole authority over compensation plans, it does not absolve us of our responsibility and the need to confront this challenge using every tool at our disposal. As David pointed out, the Business Finance and Audit Committee is scheduled to take up our basic pay plan request this afternoon, action needed to ensure that UW employees receive the same pay plan increase as all other state of Wisconsin employees. As part of that resolution, I hope the Board of Regents will state its intent to return to the Legislature's Joint Committee on Employment Relations later to request the use of institutional funds for a supplemental pay plan. That would be a strategic effort on our part to offer more uh, performance-focused pay adjustments for our faculty and staff. So I recommend in the, in the strongest possible terms that the board commit at this meeting to that course of action. After the budget picture is finalized, when our chancellors have a clearer understanding of the ongoing expenses and revenues, we should commit to coming back to this issue as soon as possible so that we can find a way to craft a supplemental pay plan that will help us hold the good people we now have in the UW and attract the next generation of talent that will keep the UW brand as strong and as bright as we all want it to be. With that, I'll turn it back to President Smith. All right, questions or comments from the board? Let me start over on this side of the table and I'll go around. Anybody? Regent Walsh. Uh, David. Thanks for the report. Uh, could you just refresh my memory? Um, two things. 
the uh, UW Systems uh, University Personnel System. As, as I recall, that was part of the 2011-2013 budget. And w would you give us just a, a brief overview of that budget as compared to this? And I, I mean just in gross numbers. Wasn't that the budget that had the $250 million base cut? And wasn't that a little bit of a consideration for that? Or do, you, do you recall that? I, what, I, what you recall? I can tell you what was in the budget. Um, we had a $250 million biennial base reduction. And then a lapse. And we had a $65 million lapse on, on top of that. Um, and then we had um, tuition revenue of 5.5% in each year. So that was the, the budget uh, last time. But it, was there a discussion at the time? I mean, obviously, we've spent a couple of years putting together that plan. Um, it, what was the reason to put it off since the work had been done and it had been part of the previous budget? I, was there a discussion on that? You mean to postpone the implementation right. of the university personnel system in Madison? Um, I attended the joint finance meeting where the, uh, the budget was discussed, and many of you may have listened to it online, so you'll know that there was actually very little discussion of a lot of the actions, uh, both that and the uh, region's authority for personnel, uh, for pay plan authority, were sort of lumped together and postponed. Um, most members said, uh, they were, post, they were postponing them and not deleting them because they wanted to um, uh, work with the board and the university staff in the future and fully understand our finances better, which they didn't feel that they did at the time. And then we would come back and, and implement those two flexibilities in the next biennium. Thanks. Yeah. Um, David. Very good job of sort of comparing the governor's uh, initial proposal with the Joint Finance Committee. I uh, suggestions. Um, I was curious because there was something that happened in between the, the governor's original proposal and the actions of the Joint Finance Committee, which is the, you know, there, were, there obviously has been a lot going on with the university, as we all know, over the last number of weeks. But uh, could you just summarize, once again, for me at least, um, the governor looked at, at, on May 15th, looked at the set of facts that were sort of currently on the table and issued an errata in which he amended his original budget proposal. Um, I wondered if you could just highlight for me the differences between the governor's amendment, amended, amended proposal, not the proposal that he made in February, but the amended proposal and the Joint Finance Committee in terms of what are the two or three or four key elements there that the Joint Finance Committee looking at the same set of facts as the governor was looking at on May 15th came up with a rather different conclusion, I guess I could say. There, there are really two. Um, the Finance Committee added the one-time cut uh, lapse of the $58 million in the first year to replace the general fund money in HIA. So that was the primary dollar change. Um, the second were the flexibilities. The, the governor retained his recommendation, or rather the errata did not delete, the governor's recommendation to provide pay plan authority to the board. There's miscellaneous, that's really, those are the important two things, I think, unless my colleagues look at me and tell me if you think there's anything else. But I think those are the two, the two things. Frida, did you want to add something? on this side of the field. We're here. Questions on this side or comments on this? Associate okay, Vice President okay. uh, Harris may add a comment. Um, you can join me. I could use the company right now. I, actually. Those were the major things that uh, were involved in there. there the, a couple of other things were the allocable segregated fee change, uh, the uh, mandatory refundable fee uh, certainly there was a new provision that was just added this week related to the Center for Investigative uh, Journalism and uh, some of those other things were added, but uh, primarily with the dollars, it was yeah. $58 million. No, it's stay. Regent Bradley. David. <coughs> I'm sorry, Mark. 
David, we had uh, cash reserves that were uh, a percentage of some number, and, and there were comparisons of where the UW system was in its cash, re cash reserves with uh, comparable systems. And as I recall it, we were, uh, I don't know if we were below the average, but we were certainly below all neighboring states. If the Joint Finance Committee recommendation goes through, where will we be in terms of our percentage on cash reserves? Um, it's very difficult um, to, to assess uh, easily, but if we look at the uh, calculations done in the governor's errata, and that was prior to the additional $58 million one-time drawdown, um, the errata said that we would be left at 22% uh, of prior year spending in, in reserves. And so if you add the, the 58 million, it would be less than, than 22%. But Could we be 20. dropping below 20%? Um, yeah, it's very hard to tell, but 20% is a very, very close number of what that 58 million might mean. And uh, I can't remember the name of the National Association that mm -hmm. people were citing as to what the recommended best practice is. What, uh, what was that number? Right. So we've done a, a great deal of research that, that we're going to discuss in, in detail in the Business and Finance and Audit Committee. Um, and regions have been involved in that research, including talking with people from the National Association of uh, University and College Business Officers. That's the association you're thinking of. Um, and they have a, a marker out there of, of 40 percent. Um, another uh, marker that, that we've stated has been 17 percent by, by government, uh, uh, government officials, uh, financial officers. So we are somewhere in between that. Even, even after this. The problem we found is finding anything that is remotely close to apples to apples. For example, we don't have uh, debt obligations. And the primary reason that institutions uh, want to carry significant reserves is the debt coverage ratio, which is one of the important metrics that is used to develop something called the, a national standard, the um, CFI, the Composite Financial Index, that uses four ratios, net operating, uh, return on net assets, primary reserve ratio, and this debt, they call it viability, but it's debt coverage ratio. So you use all four of those, and, and we've had a very difficult time, and, and we've talked with the authors of the, the, the publication that, that is the detail of all this very difficult to um, translate those into our, our budgets. I mean, we're going to have to come up with a Wisconsin formula. When we sat down with legislators and explained this, and, and, and legislators were very receptive to listening to this dialogue, and, um, that's why we got a reporting requirement, and we have until the end of the year to really think this through carefully, and come up with something that works, that isn't just an ad hoc uh, throw something in there. And we, we really appreciate the ability to develop this and study it and get back to legislators and actually work with them along the way as well. We don't plan on developing this in isolation uh, by any means. But it is quite complicated. Um, we, you know, we have a, a report of a reserve already in the student fee funded uh, uh, balances every year, and that report is 15 percent is the threshold over prior year's spending of, of those kinds of monies, and we report uh, through the board annually, and it goes through the Joint Finance Committee's passive review process, and we have to detail uh, dollars that are above the 15 percent reserve. We even looked at 15 percent and found uh, it's difficult to just pick a number and apply. 
Um, the other thing we have to uh, do a little accounting cleanup work is in being sure that we know what each of these many, many funds actually um, has going into it. One institution may uh, put an activity in one fund and another institution may put it in a different fund. There's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's all accounted for. It's all audited. But when you start applying these metrics to those, we need to be sure that we have consistency throughout this reporting. So Good. That's it's complex. Regent Drew. Yeah, I wanted to comment on, uh, to start with, on the two non, what I would consider non-budget items uh, that were passed through joint finance. Uh, one, uh, the attack on the uh, Center for Investigative Journalism, which I never heard of before yesterday. Um, uh, and I, I, I found it outrageous uh, that uh, the uh, regents are forbidden now to allow the Center for Investigative Journalism uh, on campus, uh, which seems to me to be uh, just an incredible micromanagement by the legislature uh, of academic affairs and an attack on academic freedom, uh, which totally goes against our tradition of sift sifting and winnowing and uh, finding the truth. Uh, the second non-budget item, uh, the uh, attack on the um, uh, United Council uh, and uh, uh, changing the changing from an, an opt-out to an opt-in system, uh, to me was strictly an, a, a, an attack on the students' voices and an attempt to silence uh, the voices of students, um, which we don't do a great job, I think, of speaking with one voice as students, faculty, and system to advocate uh, for uh, UW, but I, I, I do think it was totally unfair to go after uh, United Council uh, and, and effectively uh, cut off their, uh, their funding. Um, those were the non-budget items. Um, as far as the, the budget, I think the UW system, um, from President Riley on down to um, the janitors in this building, took a lot of unfair hits uh, regarding the fund balances. Um, you know, if you look at what the Legislative Fiscal Bureau said, um, our fund balances for the system um, were um, lower than most peer systems. And in fact, UW-Madison and UW-Milwaukee fund balances were the lowest of their uh, peers. Um, I think if we wouldn't have had fund balances, we would have got criticized for that. Um, I think it was a, um, an excuse to go after the system, an excuse to uh, cut funding. Um, and it's part of the unsustainable uh, trend that we have had uh, over um, the, the last uh, couple of decades of decreasing state support. Um, it affects and, and, and tuition has gone up, which has created, um, you know, crushing debt for our students and an inability of uh, working kids to get in uh, and get done. I think there was, a, there was a great story in the Journal Sentinel the other day which showed basically that it's physically impossible uh, to work enough hours at a minimum wage job to work your way through school uh, uh, anymore. Um, although students do it and they, they, do, they do find a way and manage. So the tuition freeze, that was probably a long time coming. Um, but the tuition kept going up because state appropriations kept going down. I mean, there's little other explanation for that. Um, so in the process, um, uh, uh, the faculty is left behind. Um, you, you know, I think uh, whatever we do in terms of resolutions on the faculty, uh, it's not going to uh, put us in a position where we're going to be able to do what the faculty really needs in terms of closing the gap uh, of being 18 percent and growing uh, behind their peers. Um, so I think uh, all in all, this budget is a, it's a sad day for the uh, system and really a sad, sad day for the state of Wisconsin because we are moving away from a high quality uh, public education that is affordable and accessible and um, I, I don't see that trend uh, changing. Uh, uh, flexibility is a great idea, but flexibility 
sort of like Charlie Brown's football. Um, right when we get there to get flexibility, uh, it's taken away from us in terms of compensation. So um, again, it, the, the whole budget to me is a train wreck and a sad day for the system. Reed Whitburn, were you going to say you, you had your hand up? I think there's more to it than what you've enunciated, John. Regent Walsh spoke of efforts that were taken in the new administration to get our structural uh, deficit statewide across the budget under control. University participated uh, in that. At the same time, our carry forward jumped up 60 percent in two years. Uh, no one knew that. Regents didn't know that. Um, our carry forward in the tuition line jumped up 49 percent in a hundred weeks. No one knew that. Regents didn't know that. President Riley opened his remarks here talking about what was in the, in the public uh, view. The details of what was in the public view weren't there. What was there was a line that said unrestricted assets of $860 million, up substantially in recent years. I made a motion in this room a year ago urging us to be restrainful, keeping in mind the state of the economy, keeping in mind what's going on in bill paying across Wisconsin households. 132,000 Wisconsin households. I said, cut them some slack. Let's do 4%, not 5.5%. Couldn't possibly do that. Couldn't live with that. Couldn't get by with that. Three weeks later, by the way, what I proposed would have cost, I think, less than $15 million in the tuition line. Three weeks later, the institution published a report. Didn't specify what was left over at the end of fiscal 12 in the tuition line. But after a while, it came out what was left over. What was left over was 414 million. That's what was left over. And that's the region we uh, drew why we've lost $200 million in the proposed response from the legislature. Uh, okay, I'm going to call on Jose. Just to, that tuition that we approved last year, that was a vote that was, the vote will reflect to uh, the overwhelming support for that increase. I think the report that we're talking about, the February report, has at least in four different places the carryover, as you call it. Nobody should be left with the impression that that wasn't a public discussion, a public document, also discussed publicly in the Business Finance and committee, Audit Committee meeting in February, and as it had been every year since, showing the reserve, showing the, the amount, how many months that would take, and the percentages that were consistently below the national average. So any indication in this commit in this board that that information somehow wasn't available, wasn't provided, is just not right. And I am, uh, I think you're going down a road that I have a lot of problem with, because I think you're giving the indication or the implication to the public that there was somehow some information not provided, and that's just not true. No detail. There is detail if you look in this document. Well, I've been through it. I bet you there's, there, there, there's, there's no detail on the tuition balance, on the, on the federal indirect balance, on, on, on other balance. We have the gross number without the detail. Record will it'll show. Okay, go ahead. I would uh, caution us in, in when we talk about uh, fund balance and reserves, that I think we have a responsibility to keep 
uh, as best as we can identifying that are noting, at least my understanding as I've operated in the nonprofit world and in organizations that I've directed, that even though when I say we have a reserve, it doesn't mean that I've got this pot of money that is just sitting there for anything and everything that I want to use. Uh, normally, you build reserves because you have some, you, you're projecting, you're anticipating, you're planning well. And one of the concerns that I have uh, are statements like, you know, there's this pot of money just sitting there that there's no claim to it that can be moved around. Uh, reference to, uh, again, over 800 million of unrestricted uh, money. Uh, there's a wish list which implies the, the usage of the wish list. Well, you know, it's got, you haven't quite decided whether you're going to use it or not. Uh, it's just there. I wonder how many of the contractors uh, that are working on the innovation uh, center would feel if we as regions said, well, you know, you're kind of digging this hole, you're kind of building this building, but, you know, it's kind of a wish list. We haven't really quite decided whether we're really going to let you use, we're going to let you complete it or not. You know, folks, there's a lot of things that we have gone way beyond just a wish list. There are real commitments uh, to those things. So, so I would caution us that as we continue to even define, you know, what is an appropriate reserve, that we make it very clear that that's not going to be just a pot of money that's sitting there that we as regions, the university system, can use for anything at any time. That probably even within that concept of a reserve, those funds are going to have some anticipated usage. And I think we need to help ourselves, the legislature, and the citizens understand that as a system, we don't operate like that, that we don't just put money aside and we have no idea what we're going to use it for, but we don't want to use it. And I would just continue to ask us to keep reminding people that reserves is not just this pot of gold sitting there that we have no idea why we even have it, but let's have it there anyway. Richard Higgins. I wanted to uh, uh, follow up on what uh, Regent Vasquez uh, has said. I, uh, I think he's absolutely right in that, uh, you know, we're learning a hard lesson. Uh, and it's unfortunate in many ways that uh, it has to come at the price it's come at. But it's also important for us to make lemonade out of the lemons, as Regent Vasquez points out, and work as hard as we can with the legislature and their constituents, who are our bosses, the people of the state of Wisconsin, to make sure that they do understand that the uh, funds that we uh, are entrusted with are, uh, are being used uh, as, as well as possible and being reported in, in a way that's as transparent as possible so that if they feel that we're not using them the best way possible, they can let us know and we can change because that's our job. Uh, so uh, I, I, I wholly uh, agree with you, Jose, on, uh, on, on that issue. But, David, I do have a question for you, if you, if you don't mind, uh, because we have been talking about, obviously, the, uh, the reserve issue. And one of the things that I'm still not clear about, I, I, re, I, I, you know, in, in, I don't have it in front of me, but going through my mind on that list of uh, reserve levels for systems, for instance, I noticed, I think, the U of C, University of California system has a reserve level of 199 percent. Uh, and I think that uh, in something that... Maybe it's something that Frida put out. Uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that some of the accounting for these things includes things that, for us, would be the UW Foundation and Wharf and the various foundations for the, you know, Milwaukee and others. Uh, and I, I guess my question with that is, are, for instance, the University of California institutions like that structured differently so that they're actually really part of the UC? As ours are not, as I understand, they're, they're legally and uh, 
uh, well, they're, they're separate, uh, and we don't control them. Uh, it, it, so I hope I made my question clear, uh, and I hope you'll be, do a better job of answering than I did of asking. I know exactly what your question is, and it was a legislative fiscal bureau paper uh, prepared for the Joint Finance Committee's action and background that identified uh, all the points that have been said are, are accurate about where Milwaukee and Madison were shown in a table of uh, peers. Uh, the Fiscal Bureau paper noted that a whole lot more understanding has to be brought to how do you actually compare these institutions other than numbers. For example, does a governing board who controls that institution's operating budget also have control of its ancillary um, foundations? Well, if they do, then they may be well rolled together and the assets may be much higher, their debt may be differently structured. So that's part of what we have to do. And we've already started consulting with national experts. And unfortunately, our, our very preliminary forays with, with uh, some experts has, has yielded that they don't know of institutions that, that have um, measures and, and thresholds in, in place of, of tuition funds, uh, public or private. So we're going to be doing some inventing here in this policy. And the fact that Wisconsin's structured differently than many states and that we don't have debt held by the university or board, it, it colors all of that greatly. And you're correct, Regent Higgins, our uh, foundations are detached. We only show, appropriately by, by gap accounting, only show the uh, proceeds to, directed to the university's operating budget in our reports, not their assets. Thank you. Regent Felbo and then Regent Walsh. Um, I, I want to talk just a minute about, about going forward. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to come down somewhere in between Regent Smith and Regent Whitburn which there, there might be a bit of room in there. Um, there there's been acknowledgement and agreement, I think, by all factions that more transparency is needed in our, our reserve balances. And, and I think part of the reason for that, and Jerry, you talked about how fast they grew, is just that, how fast they grew. And there was, a not, there was not enough explanation and breakdown of our balances. And so I, I think that is appropriate, that we break those down in our financials better so that they're better understood by all who look at them. Appropriate reserves uh, going forward, I think that's a work in progress because there are so many influences to these comparables that we're looking at. When you talk about these performance measures, um, debt service coverage, cash flow statements, you're, and, and, and how they relate to appropriate reserve balances, you're talking about institutions that are looking for a bond rating. Uh, so the more reserves they have and the better their, those performance measures are, the lower their interest cost is. We are very fortunate to enjoy the bond rating of the state of Wisconsin. That doesn't mean that we can't have a set of criteria uh, that's very explainable and very objective of financial goals. And I think that's where, I think that's where we're moving to. And, and I agree with David that, that that is a work in progress and we have a time frame with which we need to complete it, September 1st and January 1st. Uh, so uh, I, I think a lot of the, dis the discussion is good, but uh, our direction is to be more transparent and to set up financial goals that are, that are uh, reasonable and uh, that we can achieve to make sure that the system is financially sound. We can watch. Uh, David, um, uh, when it comes to reserves and bonds, that's a world I live in. And um, uh, what is our allocable share of the government, uh, the state bonds? I mean, we have on our cost to continue an allocation. I just can't remember the the numbers. So in a sense, we do have debt. I just don't know what we pay each year in cost to continue. Even I, though we, we aren't obligated on bonds, we don't have a bond rating such as statutory authorities. 
we do have debt that we pay the state. Now, obviously, we, we, we can't pay it, we can't pay it. Do you remember the number? Yes, and, and I'm going to use rough numbers because I don't have those sure. figures in front of me, but I do know approximately what it is. All bonds issued for uh, the university are state general obligation bonds. So they're issued, the bond buyer doesn't well, know or doesn't care what the repayment source is, but we do. Then they are categorized by the state in uh, state funded debt service for which we uh, do not carry the liability. That's the $42 million additional money put in our base budget to cover GPR bond. So issue. that would that be a roughly a billion dollars obligation then at 4%? Um, no, I think the um, annual uh, total debt service of the GPR debt is about $250 million annually. And, and of, our our billion of, of our billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 as a no. bottom line, I mean, we do have, if but, you want to compare us, we do have debt. We just don't have the same straight line obligation. But uh, let me make a comment, if I could. Um, it, 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 you know, this is simpler to me. Maybe it's because I've been on this board so long, um, and I've been here before. Um, you know, we ought to look at who we are. We're an institution that has a $5.5 billion budget. We have 46,000 employees. At any day, on 26 campuses, we're educating 181,000 students. And each year, we graduate 33, 34,000 people in the marketplace. This is a big institution. And let's call it what it is. We are very, very complicated. Jerry, I totally disagree with you that somehow this wasn't transparent. The simple fact is we are very, very complex. We issue audited statements. We're audited to death. We meet with DOA. This discussion, for me, who looks at this a lot, obviously it was there. It just happens to be that it's an item that a lot of people are asking questions on and we have a responsibility to answer. It doesn't surprise me. But what the real issue here is that, that we, we are a great institution, a, a national um, recognized and respected institution, and we are always going to have these pushes and pulls and tensions. There's going to be different decision makers every other year making decisions about us. There'll be different agendas. There'll be different politics, different partisanship. There'll be different kind of problems that they face and tensions they have. And I'm not exercised by the fact that the people disagreed with us, because that happens. I think, it's, I think it's a red herring that it's about the reserves. Rather, it's really about the economy. It's about political philosophy. But the decision makers make the decision. And frankly, you've got to live with that. And our challenge, and that's everybody in this room, especially the regents, is to go forward and tell our story. And, and I would suggest that some of you take a look at what we've done in the past when we ran into these problems. In 1986, I, mean, I wrote it down, just a second. In 1986, the legislature and this board got together and they wrote a document called Planning the Future. They revisited it when Mike Grebe, my law partner, and uh, he was a National Republican Committeeman, uh, he was Governor Walker's transition chair. They rewrote that strategy with the uh, a document that they call a study of the UW system in the 21st century. In 2004, this board, under Guy Gottschalk, wrote charting, what was it called, charting a new course. Read those documents, and every one of them repeat over and over that we are facing a public issue, and that is declining state support. But the two messages, if you read these documents, that come out over and over and over is that we are proud of the University of Wisconsin system. 
it's something that, that is really important, and this is the, lemon out of the, the lemonade out of the lemon, that we have to do something. The two goals we have are quality, a quality educational system. And in fact, in the last report, they even said if we don't have enough money, we're going to have to limit access. But number one, over and over, for 40 years of reports written by all partisan parties, has been we must maintain the quality of this institution. Now, it's a shame that, that this issue, which in my mind is, is a false issue because we are such a complex institution, you can hide, up, hide behind any ignorance that you want about our, our balance sheet. But believe me, DOA and our institution meets regularly about this. But what the real issue here is what's our challenge. And it's our challenge to persuade the decision makers that we're not an expense on a balance sheet or an income statement, but we're part of the solution. Because the second message of all those reports said, we are the greatest and biggest and we have the most potential and the capacity to be the economic driver in the state. And that's what we should be talking to the decision makers about. That's where we have to persuade them. They have their own pressures. They have their own issues. I'm not thinking that they're making a decision because they don't like us. I think they can hide behind some issues. But it's our job and our challenge and our responsibility to convince them that we are the solution and that when we said that we would educate the children in this state of Wisconsin and we would continue to make this institution proud, we took on a responsibility, and that's our challenge. We can't expect people to be handing us money all the time, and we're going to get hit over the head if we make a mistake. But don't lose track of the target. And finally, I just want to add that that isn't in this budget, but we made a promise a while back to families, particularly first-generation families, that we're going to send kids to school. And we said to them that when they're sitting around the dinner table and the kids are in sixth and seventh grade, we want them talking about higher education. We don't want them talking about whether or not they're going to ever get a job. And we made a commitment to them. And if I have any criticism, it is that I'd like to revisit that. But I'd like to take it to the legislature and convince them that we had something going and that we changed the momentum of this state. Because there's going to be great competition against us when the rest of the states wake up and find out we've got something here. But in the meantime, we have to convince the legislature because we are the governor's university, we're the legislator's university, we're the citizens of Wisconsin's university. It doesn't belong to us. And so if we hit the couple road bumps, speed bumps, um, my challenge, and I hope for all of you, will be, okay, let's... Let's, let's consider this an intellectual challenge and we're going to change people's minds and not criticize them. Thanks. Regent Bartell. Thank you. Uh, I, much of what I was going to say, David just said, um, I kind of regard this as a teaching moment for all of us. Um, as I've observed what's gone on in the last three, four weeks, um, what was originally a substantive concern about the UW's finances has now turned into, I think, uh, in most quarters, uh, a, a urging us to be more transparent, more educational, more informative, to provide information uh, to the public and to our decision makers about how this system operates from a financial standpoint. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, with that with that notion, I think that's one of the one of the teaching points that we have here. We didn't do a good enough job in uh, in educating our decision makers on on our finances. I think the numbers were there, uh, maybe not in the form that some some people would would want them, but the, the numbers were available publicly, and and it shouldn't have been as much of a surprise. Uh, as evidence that we need to do more, uh, it was the vitriol and, uh, that, that came on us, on President Riley, and on the system from uh, some legislators. It was unparalleled in my experience in uh, watching 
the relationship between the university and the legislature in the last several decades. Um, it was uncalled for, I think, unwarranted, and um, uh, but we need to we need to repair that um, as as we can. Uh, I'm hoping that as a result of all of this, we will um, move forward as a board of regents. Um, I like to say that from time to time, I'm asked now now that the um, a board is becoming, it's, it's now about evenly divided between Doyle appointees and uh, Walker appointees. Uh, some of us are Democrats, some of us are Republicans. And I'm often asked, is, is this turnover going to change things for the university? And I um, say that I think that once we become regents, we have a, a primary objective, and that is to support the UW system whether we come at it as, uh, as uh, Democratic appointees or Republican appointees. And I hope that uh, as I'm getting ready to uh, retire from this position, I hope that my successor and, and uh, those successors that come after, uh, after us will keep that in mind, that we, that we are not uh, partisans on this board. We are uh, supporters of the University of Wisconsin system and uh, we should do what we can to retain the quality that uh, Regent Walsh was uh, referring to and that we have been so proud of uh, as we were appointed to this board, as we served here and as we, we retire. Um, this is a teaching moment and uh, I hope we will all learn from them. Jose? Just a few thoughts. One of them is on, that con on the concept of transparency. Um, I get worried about uh, us saying we've got to be transparent or we've got to be more transparent. Uh, because when I hear that, it almost implies I'm not being open. I'm, I'm keeping something and now you're forcing me to show something that I wasn't before. I don't believe that has ever been the case. Uh, not when you have uh, things like, I think it's still there, the Red Book, where you can find the salary of the lowest paid employee and the salary of the highest paid employee, where you can find just about anything in this system, uh, just about any document. So for us to to Keep, I, I think we have to be better at communicating, but I caution us from, again, that we have to be more transparent. What is it that we're hiding? We're not hiding anything. This is a public institution. Any citizen can ask via public uh, information request for just about anything. Uh, so I would caution us. I think that it's a matter of how we, and I would agree with David, that it's a matter of how we communicate uh, what is going on and what we're doing. The other thing, and I'd like to follow in, in Regent Bartell's comments, in a lot of work that I've done with not-for-profits and with board directors is that your first and foremost responsibility is to ensure the the strong viability and the quality of the institution you're governing. To be quite frank about it, the biggest concern that I have in all of this is, and I go back to Regent Drew, is the amount of or number of instances where other external entities are making decisions about this institution that we are governing. And I think that uh, we need to have, and those of you that are the new appointees and that are part of this administration, I think we need to have a very serious discussion with the legislature and with the governor. What is it that you want us to govern and how do you want us to govern? And let's have that discussion because if we continue to lose ability to make decisions over this system, 
I would dare to say we're no longer a true governing board. We're a advisory body. We're an ambassadorship body. But somebody else is really going to make the decisions about that. And I think that is, for me, far more of a worry that I have than all this discussion on the budgets. When you have, as we heard this morning, and it's not simply reporting back to the legislature, but it's to seek their approval. And it's one after another, after another, after another. When they come in and say, we're going to ask that that no longer be on campus, that this is no longer going to be there. Where is our governing role in that? And I think that's a serious discussion that needs to be had, that if there is no faith and trust in this being a governing body, then let's say that and make it a, an advisory board, make it an ambassadorship board. But don't call it the Board of Regents because that's not what we are. And I would hope that there are enough of us here that we can have a meaningful dialogue with key leadership in this state and say, do you really want us to be governors over this institution and give us the ability to truly do it? And that does mean that we have to hold our employees accountable. But let us, in our governing role, be the first body that holds our institution accountable. And if we fail, then go ahead and let's talk about something else. But I don't think we are anywhere near that failure point. Mr. Miller. We've just... Am I on? Yeah. Right. We've just heard a fine example of how an institution that many of us saw 10 years ago has met the changing com and complexities of both financing and delivery with Chancellor Lovell's pr presentation about what's going on at this campus at UW-Milwaukee. Those same approaches are happening to our campuses all over. Each campus has had to realize what has happened in this new environment of financing, course delivery, differences in student populations, and they're all going about it. Is it not surprising that we as an institution are facing the same kinds of change challenges? Regent Bartell talked about a teaching moment. This is a very important teaching moment. It's an important teaching moment for uh, the UW system administration. It's an important teaching moment for us. I don't want to spend the, uh, the issue of, we can spend a lot of time debating the line item and, and various of us will fall on both sides of that discussion. But that's wasting time and energy that we should be, do, that we should be spending examining what we are doing ourselves as board members, as a board, and examining what's happening at our system. Just as the campuses, our fine campuses, has, have been doing for the past decade. And, and David, your comments about, te sorry, Regent Walsh, <laughs> your comments about te what must go on with teaching not only our legislators, but the parents and the families and, and the taxpayers in our, in our state about this fine, composite, complex institution of campuses, extension, and research universities is very, very important. So I would hope that we would take this teaching moment, we would grow on it, and spend time with one another and ourselves deciding how we're going to proceed in the future. Anybody else? Chancellor Gell. I think, oh, good. We were very honored to have the governor visit uh, our campus yesterday. And as you know, he's a very down to earth man and very easy to talk to. And, and we had some good conversations. And at one point, I said to the governor, you know, you gave us one of the best uh, budget proposals we've seen in a long, long time. And frankly, we squandered that. 
And he said to me, well, you know, you need to rebuild those relationships with the legislators. And I think we will all do that. And, and it's important to remember at joint finance, that was not uh, a strictly partisan vote, which, you know, I noticed that in lacrosse, naturally. Um, so there's a lot of work for all of us um, to do, and uh, we will do it. And one of the things I think that David gave a very fine presentation that I hope we will remember is what we will face in the next go round you know, 15, 17, because we're going to have a pay plan for our employees. It won't be huge, but it will be something, and it's much needed. But the tuition piece of that, we will have to sell funds, and we'll do that through reserves, which are one-time monies, but we'll have that obligation in the next biennium, and if you were to address that just with tuition, you'd go from a freeze now, which we all support, but about, we estimate about 9%. You know, so we're going to need GPR. Uh, we're going to need the legislators uh, on our side. And I think the comments about a learning moment are very um, well made. This has been an incredible learning moment for all of us. And, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll put this kind of maybe uh, bluntly, but, you know, we, we, our reserves, we use a big chunk of it to build a parking ramp. Nobody really ever asked about that before, and now we know that they are, so we need to be sensitive to how we do what we do, and I think that the Regent dialogue on a reserve policy will be very critical, and, and we're eager on the campuses to know how would you like us to do this. Um, I would add, I would imagine that Mike has had such great success here at Milwaukee with reserves being used very judiciously um, another thing that we're proud of on our campus is, and I told the governor this, our housing fee next year will be flat, and we will actually reduce our fees for parking in that ramp, reduce our fees for dining, and reduce our fees for textbook rental, and our students will pay about $95 less next year to go to La Crosse. That's very important, and how we do that is through reserves and we spread costs out. So I think there's a lot of um, education that we need to do uh, with legislators and the public and so on. It's just that, as, as um, Regent Walsh said, this is so complex, yet we live in a world where you have photos and newspapers and headlines, and it has to be just very uh, simplified. But I'm delighted to hear David um, with that spirit of we will weather this and uh, learn from it and we'll keep going. Thank you. Anybody else? Richard Pruitt. Just, just if I briefly to follow up on Joe's comment, I just, I just wanted to, to, to note, and I, I realize that, that there's a lot, um, this would be an up, this is an uphill challenge, but there really is an alternative budget to the Joint Finance Committee budget that is out there, and that is the governor's, Governor Walker's amended budget of May 15, uh, which while would have, if, if that had, if the Joint Finance Committee had gone along with it, would have been challenging certainly. It, it provided, as we all recognize this morning, some important tools in terms of addressing the compensation crisis that this university faces. It would, fr it would freeze tuition for the next two years, which is something I think we're all in agreement on. And I know it's, I know it's hard, but I, I do think that we might consider at least raising our individual and collective voices uh, to, the, to the full assembly, the full Senate, and ask them to take a look at, at that budget and at that proposal uh, and consider whether or not it would provide many of the things that, that uh, they desire while also providing this university system with the opportunity to more effectively move forward. And I, I'd at least like to encourage folks to think about that going forward. All right. Tracy. Uh, I would... I don't know if this is on. Uh, I would like to follow that by saying I've been hearing a lot about how we need to be responsive to our legislators and our elected officials because so they can support this great system. And what I'd like to state is maybe the obvious, but these uh, elected officials are ultimately responsible to their constituents. And those constituents are scattered throughout the state and the small towns, the big cities. 
what I would like to, to see this board do, and I hope to do myself, is to start this grassroots effort to show the citizens of this state, and maybe not even show, just remind what they already know about the importance of this system to the economic well-being of this state. We talk a lot about first-generation students. I am one, and weirdly enough, at the same time, so are my children, since I haven't gotten my degree yet. And I would like to say that for many of these, these families, these middle-income families, this, this system is their, is their option. They can't afford other options out of state. As many of them, their, student, their children may be bright enough to get into these schools, but this system is the option. And I would like at the grassroots level to remind the citizens of this state of the importance of this. Go ahead. Oh, there we go. Uh, I've been a, a member of a system campus for over a quarter of a century. I've been coming to these meetings for a decade now, and I know it's been a very difficult few weeks, and I'd just like to say I, I think this is one of the most important and profound discussions that I've heard uh, during my time here, and I just want to, to thank everyone for the level that we got to today in these discussions, talking about not only what's the best way to, to finance uh, the system's educational needs, but to make it transparent, if that is in, indeed the issue, but to talk about quality at a time like this when that's so important. We're not only responsible to the citizens of the state for how we finance it, we're responsible to them for the quality that we maintain as well. I think it's been a great discussion and I just wanted to, to thank everybody here today. So thank you. Hard to follow that. Anybody else? <laughs> President Raley. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I want to thank Provost Stearns for, for saying that. Uh, a number of you have talked about the teachable moment and I think it is that. Uh, I've learned a lot, uh, especially during my two-hour appearance before the uh, Joint Finance Committee, for those of you who, who watched that. Um, I think one of the things we've learned is that uh, our financial model has now changed profoundly enough that we have to come up with new ways to talk about it to ourselves and to the citizens of Wisconsin so that these reserves, which are now a much more important part of the way we finance the great work that our faculty and staff do, are much more central than they were nine years ago when I became president. Uh, when I talked to Mike Lovell uh, right after the news of, of the balances started to get out there and we started to get some of the reaction we did, I, he was one of the first people I talked to, and I remember he said to me, Look, this isn't money we have laying around. I have these commitments for the School of Freshwater Sciences, for the School of Public Health, for the Innovation Campus that everybody in the state wants us to do. You learn more about where he is in doing that today. And I have some money from the state, great money for the state, for the buildings, but I don't have any state money to operate these buildings and these programs. We have carefully gathered these reserves so that we will be able to use them for those purposes because we thought that was the right thing to do. I think we didn't explain that enough and regularly enough to the people of Wisconsin and I think we need to do that now in the future because we do have a different kind of model that we're working with now and we probably didn't realize how profoundly that model had changed soon enough. So with all of your help and with the help of the chancellors and the provosts and a lot of other people, I think we can uh, simplify the explanation and get the people out there to understand how we're using the money that they pay in tuition, how we're using the money that all citizens put into us and in uh, uh, the taxes they pay, how lots of other entities that uh, provide revenue to the university, uh, how they help fund us and how we do good things with it. There will be lots more detail about all that out there in the future. And we'll be able, I think, by virtue of that detail now, to talk about that new financial model in a way that we'll have, at the end of the day, people saying, yeah, that's, that's the way you ought to be using these monies, wherever they come from. 
So thank you for that very good discussion. All right. Well, we'll switch from uh, switching topics from our budget to athletics for a minute. Um, you recall in uh, November, thank you, David, uh, the Board of Regents approved a new reporting guidelines calling for UW institutions that participate in, in NCAA Division I athletics to annually provide information to the board regarding academic, fiscal, and compliance matters related to NCAA Division I intercollegiate athletics. The UW system has three institutions with Division I uh, athletics. UW-Madison reported last December. Green Bay is going to report this fall. Today we'll hear from UW-Milwaukee. And leading that discussion will be Chancellor Lovell and Athletic Director Amanda Braun. Well, thank you, and we do appreciate the running behind and that uh, we're, we're, we're pushing up already past lunch, so we're going to be as efficient as we can and try to uh, present in about 15 minutes. And I think uh, all of you, are, I think, are familiar, particularly the regents, uh, with Madison and Big Ten Athletics. I think uh, what I want to make sure you understand what it's like to be a mid-major, because it's much different than um, to be at that, that level. Now, UWM, as long with UW Green Bay, we're both part of the Horizon League. And one of the things that I love about the Horizon League, when we talk about student athletes, it's actually students first, you know, in the classroom their success, and athletes second. So in our, <clears throat> in our world, uh, these student athletes we have are really some of the leaders that we have on campus. Now, why, why is it important for UWM to be uh, Division I? It's, again, we don't have a football team, but it's very important for us to still have brand recognition, particularly when you're a market uh, like Milwaukee. You know, when you have somebody like the Brewers, you have uh, the Bucks, and even Marquettes, who have much bigger name recognition than we do, and so having Division I Flex is another way that we can get our name out there because people will never apply to a school that they don't know the name of. And so that's something that's important for us. Um, another thing that's very important is, as we, you heard earlier from me today, we have much more traditional student body than we've had in the past. We have 15,000 students that live near campus. Uh, we need to provide more things for them to do on the nights and the weekends. And so it's part of a college experience to be able to have them attend Division I basketball games, other Division I athletic events. It's another way that we connect them to the university so that they're better students, they're more successful, and then when they graduate, they're better alumni. And speaking of alumni, we have 150,000 living alumni. And one of the best ways to engage them and to build a sense of pride institutions through athletics. You know, we've not done the best job. We're still a young institution of, of cutting with those alumni and utilizing them in their time and talent. So uh, having the athletics is something they can connect with us with and be proud of is something we're excited about. Also, building pride in our community, both in the campus community between our faculty and staff and the greater Milwaukee community, our neighbors, uh, people in the city being proud of our institution and what we do. Athletics plays an important part in that. So when we talk about what it means to be successful, I mentioned before that we are students first, athletes second. Uh, so measuring success in our athletic program is actually starts with me measuring success in the classroom. And I am very, very proud. I'm very proud to stand here for you today to talk about our student athletes and how successful they are uh, in the classroom. For 25 straight semesters, our athletic program has had a grade point average of above 3.0. Uh, this past year, it was a 3.17. Uh, more than one-third of our 300 uh, student athletes are on the Rise League academic honor roll. And uh, just this past semester, we had 22 of our uh, 300 student athletes achieve a grade point average of 4.0. That's 14% of our student athletes got a 4.0 last semester. I can compare that with any cohort on our campus, and I guarantee you that's going to be the highest core of 4.0 students. So clearly, they are doing great things in the classroom. Uh, some of our teams are just, just amazing. Our women's volleyball team, for example, had a team GPA of 3.6 last year. Um, we've had 11 academic All-Americans in the last eight years. And our graduation rate of 82% for our student athletes is uh, almost double the rate of our general student body. So clearly, they're doing fantastic. Uh, the other thing that's exciting is how much success we've had on the playing field. And I will just say that uh, they've done this in many times without having facilities that uh, match up to the standards of their athletic success. We have won many uh, Horizon League track and field championships without a track, many baseball championships without a baseball field. And um, it really attributes to the coaching and the, and the staff that we have. We've won six McCaffrey trophies, which is given for the All Sports Award um, uh, in the Horizon League for the combined number of championships and points. We've had 34 teams have NCAA tournament appearances uh, in that time. Uh, we've had 118 uh, Horizon League championships. Um, I think that is more than any other institution in the Horizon League. And just as an example is, is our women's soccer team. 
Uh, a women's our team has made the NCAA tournament the last five consecutive years. Uh, uh, last year, a year and a half, two years ago, we had uh, the country's uh, leading scorer, Sarah Hagen, you know, on our team. Uh, she was an All-American for, I believe, uh, three or four years she was here. But we've done this while the team has maintained a grade point average between 3.5 and 3.6. Uh, which is just, just phenomenal. I think they've been able to have success both ways. And we talk about our success. We do not, most of our student athletes, if not all of them, very few of them ever expect to be, become professional athletes and be paid for that during their careers. What we are really doing through our athletic programs are building the, the future leaders of society. And I have a couple of student athletes up here with me today, um, uh, Dean Simon, Emily McClellan, that really represents uh, what our student athletes stand for. Uh, Dan is, you know, he was an uh, academic all league in, tra in track and field. He holds, he's a five time Horizon League champion. He holds uh, both the school and league decathlon record. Um, uh, he owns the heptathlon record. He's been a men's senior athlete of the uh, year award. Just done phenomenal things. And by the way, he started out as a walk on on our campus and really built his way up to that. Uh, similarly, Emily McClellan uh, actually. Um, and I think the both Wisconsin natives as well uh, came to us, and uh, she's just done phenomenal things in, in the pool. For, uh, she's her three years here, she's won her Ivy League championships in all three events she competed in: the 200 IM, the 100, 200 meter breaststroke. Uh, she's a two-time uh, collegiate swimming All-American. Uh, she was a female athlete of the year this year, and for those of you who happened to watch the Olympic trials last year, she just missed uh, going to London and being on Team USA. Um, in the finals, she was just beat out by, by a, few, uh, a few tenths of a second. But she still is on Team USA, and she's going to be competing at the World University Games in uh, Kazan, Russia, uh, later this year. And we just thought we'd uh, uh, give uh, uh, Dan Simon just a chance to talk, and Emily will be available for any questions you may have to talk about what it means for him to have uh, Division I athletics shown on campus while he attends UWM. So, Dan? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Lavelle for uh, having me today. Um, my name is Dan Simon. I was a multi-event competitor on the track and field team. The past four years being a student athlete hasn't been easy. I actually came here as a walk-on, kind of unsure and intimidated, but I worked hard, put in my best effort, and pushed myself to new limits. Now I hold the school record in the heptathlon and the decathlon, along with a few other top school performances. Um, I've learned to take all the opportunities I can because this unique experience of being a student athlete uh, goes so fast that I can't believe uh, my career has come to an end already. My experience here at UWM has left me with mem many memories. Most of them are great memories, like winning conference meets, winning races, getting new personal records, making friends. Some are also not the greatest, like fighting injuries every season, having bad performances, and competing in cold, rainy weather. Through the good and the bad, I wouldn't have changed a thing. The people I have met and the friends I have made through this journey have changed my life in the best way and have shaped me into the person I am today. I couldn't be more proud to be a Panther student athlete and contribute to my team and to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Thank you. Emily's being bashful. She doesn't want to say anything, but she'll answer questions, I guess. Um, the biggest challenges that mid-majors face in, uh, is, is are the fiscal challenges. Uh, when I became chancellor, I was very surprised to learn. I, got, I went to a presentation by Mark Emmerit from the NCAA, and he said there's only 20 athletic programs in the country that actually pay for themselves. All the rest, all of the, the, the hundreds of other programs actually need support from the institution. And uh, being a mid-major, um, that is something that is, is really important, the institutional support, both from the student seg fees and from the institution itself to, to make athletics go at, at these uh, mid-major Division I schools. Uh, one thing, uh, Amanda Braun, who I'm going to present in a second, our, our new athletic director, is going to talk about how we spend, but we really spend in the medium of our peers, uh, both re with respect to the institutional support and for our student fees. And even though over the past three years we've um, We've presented a balanced budget, I'd like to present a balanced budget on how to move forward. Uh, we still have had a, a growing uh, fiscal deficit. If you look at the report, which has been given to you about UW Athletics, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. Um, the deficit is really, in my opinion, is, is, is going up for two reasons. One is uh, one of the things you do at the mid-major, obviously, is it's very important your fundraising and your sponsorship efforts. You know, those are really important for, for keeping your athletic program you know, operating in the black. 
Uh, I think this recession hurt us, particularly in the fundraising for athletics. And the second thing is in leadership. We've had uh, several, we've, had, we've gone through four athletic directors in the last four years. Obviously, when you have that type of over turn leadership, um, it's a, you struggle to reach some of your goals. I'm very happy to say that over last, last year on interim basis, we brought in Andy Geiger, who I introduced last year at this meeting, who uh, was a, he's an athletic director's Hall of Fame. He's really been able to stabilize the athletic program while we search for a new full-time athletic director. And so I'm very proud uh, to present today uh, Amanda Braun, who is, is no stranger to uh, Wisconsin. You know, Amanda came to us from Northeastern, uh, but before that, uh, she w was from Green Bay, and um, she's a, a Wisconsin native, and uh, she grew up with a small town. What's the ground? She grew up in the small town of Broadhead, Wisconsin, which happens to be uh, the hometown of one of our basketball players, J.J. Panofsky. Uh, but we're really happy to have Amanda on board. She has a very strategic approach on how we're going to move our athletic, athletic program forward, and particularly in the ways that we're going to work on addressing some of the challenges we have, particularly with the facilities and the, the financial uh, fiscal deficit. So, Amanda? I guess it's no longer good morning, so good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chancellor Lovell, for that introduction. Thank you all for, for having uh, us here today to talk about uh, UWM Athletics. Uh, last month, just a few weeks into my new job, I learned that I would have the opportunity to speak to you all. So I will say that uh, one of the first thoughts uh, that came to mind was intimidation uh, for me. That was certainly a word uh, when I thought about that in my first month. Um, but that was a temporary feeling uh, as I realized what a wonderful opportunity this is for us to come and showcase what we do on behalf of our student athletes and all the things that they achieve. So uh, grateful to be here today. I'm especially grateful for the opportunity to follow Chancellor Lovell's lead and not just uh, today presenting to you, uh, but in the way he leads our university. I truly appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness and, uh, and his ambition and the way he leads and especially in the way that he consistently prioritizes the best interests of our students. Uh, that's very important to me, one of my values. Uh, so an easy transition for me to come here and work with him. Uh, as he did point out in his remarks, uh, we have a great deal to be proud of uh, with our athletics programs and the value that we add to this institution. As a Division I uh, university that is considered uh, mid-major, as he, as he described us, we also have unique challenges relative to our peers in what they call the football ball subdivision uh, of Division I, uh, very different animal, if you will. So Chancellor Level shared a bit about what it means to be in the Horizon League and be uh, the, the mid-major level. I, I wanted to share with you uh, some additional detail with regard to our financial position um, within the Horizon League amongst our peers. So I can start there. Uh, total athletics expenses. So setting the context over what it means to be the mid-major uh, financially, you can add a zero to these numbers if you're at the football bowl subdivision level. It, it's, it's very, very different. Um, so, so these are based on the 2011-12 figures uh, that we pulled so just to demonstrate uh, where we are. The range in the Horizon League, uh, a pretty broad range public versus private institutions, number of sports sponsored, that sort of thing. Uh, UWM right, right about at the average within, within our conference. Uh, as a percentage of the overall university expenditures, again, a, a pretty broad range, UWM below the average, because this takes into consideration public and private institutions, the cost of attendance and that, that sort of thing, but, but gives you the context for where we are. And then Something that we talk about often is the, uh, the support we receive from our students and from the university. Very, very important to us in our, in our operations at this level. And again, the range is broad. If we drill down a little bit further, uh, the 8.6 million that UWM uh, devotes and invests in athletics is about $4.7 million in student fees and about $3.9 million uh, from the university support. And 3.1 of that 8.6 is scholarship support, 2.7 um, of it coming from the university. So it's an interesting fact that a lot of people look at Division I institutions and think about student athletes that come and don't pay a thing. And uh, I, I can tell you that at our level, we have in, at, at Milwaukee uh, less than 50 student athletes that are on a full scholarship. So that leaves us with a little over 250 student athletes who pay a part of or all of uh, their way to come to UWM. And we, we estimate that to be about three and a half million dollars that our student athletes uh, contribute and, and that they pay to be here at UWM and to represent us. As Chancellor Lovell pointed out, 
some of our most successful and high achieving students at our university. So we're, we're um, proud of them and, and happy that, that they've chosen us uh, for a variety of reasons. As a percentage of the athletics revenue, those two things, university support, student fee support, again, a broad range within our league. Um, we are just above the league average and nationally that is that number is about 80%, uh, pretty consistent nationally with the numbers of Division I institutions that are not within, again, the full subdivision, the big time level of athletics. So one of the things that I am very excited to get started on is finding a way to, um, to do our part a little bit more in supporting our athletics programs. Uh, so there are about three major categories of revenue that we can influence at our level. Um, unfortunately, one of those is not multimedia television deals like you see at some of these large institutions and, and their conference affiliation. Uh, that isn't an option for us. So, so we'll look to uh, three major categories. The first one you see here are corporate sponsorship sales. Uh, this is where we are within our league. Uh, about 550,000 of that for us is, uh, is cash and there is some trade in there, but we're doing very well in that category. I do think there is opportunity for growth. Uh, we're going to be consulting with some folks to understand a little bit better how we're doing in that area, but a strength of ours. Ticket sales, this includes all of our ticket sales uh, for our, um, the home competitions. About 90% of that is men's basketball. Um, so we do have room for growth. I think engaging our community, uh, doing our part to elevate the profile of the institution, uh, getting out and being more visible and energizing people to come out and, and contribute in that way uh, as fans and, and through ticket sales is, is an opportunity for us as well. And then finally, this is where I think we have the greatest opportunity for growth uh, because fundraising is really about uh, building relationships and uh, engendering trust amongst those people you're trying to get support you. With leadership turnover here at Milwaukee, we have lagged, as you can see. Uh, that is a one-year snapshot, but that's very consistent over time. We're about 40 percent below the average, and I, I see that as an opportunity. I think um, we are, are going to be able to stabilize our program and engage alumni and community people uh, to, to build the trust and relationships that we need to in order to, uh, to help ourselves, help ourselves, if you will. So through a couple of things, you, you, I think you have in front of you a strategic plan that was not uh, developed entirely under my leadership. I was able to contribute to that uh, just before we finalized it within the last couple of weeks. Uh, but, but activating that strategic plan, being a significant part of the university's comprehensive campaign are, are going to be uh, very important for us moving forward. Um, I think a great time and a good time for us to tell our story uh, inspire people to join us in supporting our student athletes to help us prepare the next Dan Simon and the next Emily McClellan uh, for life of leadership and achievement beyond their time here at UWM. So I thank you for your time. I don't know if we've got time for questions. I think we're between you and lunch, which I feel badly about, uh, but happy to field, field any questions you might have. Okay. I have, I have a question. I, I, I went through your materials. I haven't had a chance to look at the strategic plan yet. Uh, what is your plan? How do you manage compliance issues? Do you have a compliance officer? How is that? How is that? Uh, sure. How is that ma generally managed? Okay. She asked about compliance and how we generally manage that. Well, I, I came up. That was part of my role uh, from the beginning of my career. Uh, so I do. Um, you know, I believe heavily in making sure that we're doing the right things. Uh, the first thing is having great people, that you hire great people. And we're, I'm fortunate to have walked into a situation where there's terrific people in our department. We do have a compliance, um, an assistant athletic director on our staff who also has another person that helps him with the day-to-day -day, uh, compliance operations. It's something that we'll talk about consistently. I had our first all-department department-wide meeting yesterday, and, and that was an area that we that we discuss as being a high priority for us. Questions, comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? Better, I better ask now before I wrap up. Mike, do you have anything? Okay. Um, okay, well, that would be it for our first session here. The lunch is in Ballroom East. We'll probably let's try to start as close to 1.15 as we can this afternoon on the the two meetings and then the Education Committee and Business Finance are probably more like 2.15. So uh, just to put it back about 15 minutes. Thank you.